What's up? What's up? <laughs> hey, man. I'm good, man. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good, man. Awesome. Good to finally meet you, man. Is it Gibran? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Gibran, Gibran. Like, Gibran. You know, like LeBron? Like LeBron? Gibran, yes, yeah. yes. That's a good shout, actually. Re LeBron. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to try to say LeBron then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Gibran. Gibran, Gibran. Uh, my, nickname, my nickname actually was Gibran Lames. <laughs> <laughs> was, was that an Xbox? <laughs> no, I don't even know where that came from. Because I play basketball too, right? So people Fair. Are like LeBron James. Fair LeBron enough. Lames, yeah. are, are you, I mean, how tall are you? I'm six, six feet. Fair, fair. That's that's pretty average, then, isn't it? Like, yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean like, yeah. It's 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 it's, yeah. it's all right. Uh, I'm iffy, by the way, so you can you can call me iffy. Um, awesome. Okay. So it's iffy is with it one short F. Short for something? Yes. Um, it's short for Ifanya Chuku, but Ifanya Chuku. Okay, I thought it was I thought it was short for Iftikhar, but that was something different. Never mind. Where is that name from? Uh, it's like a Middle Eastern name. I oh, know, I thought you were like, yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah. If, if car. Yeah. No, I'm I'm Nigerian. If you cut, interesting. Okay, I have to look out. You know, for if that. if the car, if the car, like this, I'll spell it out. Wait, wait, wait. If the car, uh, yeah, like this. If the car, if the car. Ah, I yeah, see, I see. Yeah. Fair enough. So, where are you from then? Um, sort of. I know no, you're. I know Toronto. you're in Toronto right now. But what's your like ethnicity? Oh, what's background. your background? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So both my parents are actually uh, Indian. So I'm 100 Indian. Nice. North or south? Yeah. Uh, I'm like from Mumbai, uh, Bombay, Mumbai. So like, oh, middle. fair. That's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's more the central. I, I've got friends in Chennai, which is south. So I always, uh, yeah? yeah. All I can think about is just the biryani, man. That's all I think about. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> have, you, have you tried uh, dosa? Yes, yeah, so it's a pancake things, right? Um, yeah, the pancake thing. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I had a friend living with me once. Um, he was from Chennai, and uh, yeah, he used to make that. Um, he was a developer. And interestingly, every single morning he had his routine. He woke up at six o'clock and he always cook his meals. And it, I could just smell the spices. It would wake yeah. me up. So I, I didn't even I didn't even need a, I didn't need an alarm to wake me up for for work. Oh, I, yeah? I just needed his spices That's to do hilarious. it. <laughs> That's hilarious. That's hilarious. Wow. Damn. Awesome. Yeah, okay. What is it like in Toronto then? Uh it's 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 popping, man. It's popping. I, I, I <laughs> guess funny, thing, funny thing, you guys, you guys have a lot of uh, UK slang, right? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. you know, like for for instance, I'll give an example. Like you you know like the police, right? Do you, do you guys call them boy them? Like in in the UK, boy them. Is that uh, thing or no? I don't know. No, not really. Not not in my or, or circle. Like man them. Yeah, man, man, but that's not the police though. Man them is more like in reference to. Yeah, for your and, friends. Another yeah, group yeah, of your people. Group. So it could yeah, be your yeah, friends. Yeah. It could be anyone else. Just like the man them is like yeah 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 so in toronto we have a lot of like uk slang that's like come over like interesting like toronto slang is like yo man them like wagwan and like oh, <laughs> wagwan yes wagwan is definitely yeah, wagwan, uk wagwan. do you reckon that's come yeah. from like the music bill the influence or do you reckon uh, yeah, it's just social so. media i think i think it's music mm. uh and it's, yeah i think it's music pretty much because a lot of people like don't say that like they, like people like this UK for like their accent and like all that sort of stuff, right? Yeah. Like, um, all that sort of stuff. But I, I think actually like they get a lot of stuff from there. So it's a funny, uh, funny thing, I guess. Yeah, I, I was. So that's what Toronto is. Yeah. Sweet, sweet. I was watching a documentary once about like just drill music. I don't know if you've heard of drill music. Yeah, and I how it was, it, was, yeah, it was getting so popular because it's all sort of starting in the UK and it's like, and I watched the documentary and it's like Japanese people doing drill and there's like Canadians doing drill. It's like it's everyone's like yeah, so it was quite interesting to see how that culture sort of spread and I guess yeah. as well the language and the sort of um the nuances as well sort of get spread as well. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I, have, I have no clue. Like all my friends are listening to like UK like rap music. I'm like, where where did this come from? And then it's just like all over the place now. Like that's, um yeah that's interesting i had a conversation with a friend yesterday he makes um he's proper into hip-hop and he makes like lo-fi beats and he yeah. literally made the comment about how the uk scene itself uh in hip-hop in spe uh, specifically um i guess the, you're saying that the, the the scene here is obviously nowhere near as big as like uh in america for example right mm -hmm. and um you're saying that if like if he was trying to capture any sort of market share, like one percent of you know zero point one percent of America would be lots of it. You get what I mean? But in the UK, it wouldn't really be the same. So what would you say about Toronto? Yeah. Like I know you mentioned rap, but do you think hip hop is a big thing there? Or oh yeah, totally. I mean, we have Drake. Oh yeah, <laughs> one flex. Yeah, Fair. We, got, we got Drake. Fair. We got um. We we have OVO here. We, we have EXO. You know EXO, right? Like the weekends weekends label. So yes, yes. Weekends from Toronto. So um. Oh yeah, ah, we, we have like so, a lot of musicians from from Toronto. Yeah. So I guess you are right. It is really popping over there, man. Yeah, it is good. and Justin Bieber. <laughs> technically, technically, he's um Justin Bieber's from 
London, Ontario. It's kind of funny, actually. London, yeah, Ontario. yeah, yeah. But um, that's like Greener Toronto or whatever. So yeah, he's also from like here. So we have a huge music background, I guess. You basically have everything, man. <laughs> and then and then we've got you jibran as well um so <laughs> i'm just gonna dive straight into you because um when i when i commented on your linkedin <laughs> comment right <laughs> i love i love how like random it was like this is like literally serendipity man like a linkedin like, comment I, I literally was like i saw that post and i was like just shrimp and i was like wait, wait, wait hold on i remember this like line from that one movie and then i was, I, I literally just googled like, the thing and i just pasted it and boom you pasted that and then yeah, it was not. Nah, it was it was genuine, like you said, serendipity. Uh, serendipity. Like it, it was really funny because I I messaged you there, and I guess I tend to do that specifically, like for Lex Friedman, right? I mean, yeah. I guess compared to other, like LinkedIn can be very superficial, right? So um, I don't tend to put too much energy into it because people tend yeah. to like pretend to be their best on there. But for oh, certain yeah. people, for some, for some, for certain people, especially like Lex. I find that the people who tend to like interact and engage with his post tend to be in some way, shape or form quite interesting, right? <laughs> so uh, that, that was basically it. So um, when I commented on your post, I sort of like clicked on your account and then that sort of led me to the YouTube stuff you did uh, and the video you made on CRISPR. And I'll give you a little bit of background as to why I actually reached out. Um, so I, I, I heard about CRISPR for the first time in 2015, my first year in uni, and uh, it was a TED talk and it just it just blew my mind right i was like wait we can edit our genes using this protein crazy um so i said it sort of uh again I, i'm not a i'm not a bioscientist or anything like that if anything i'm more of a uh systems architect i like to design digital systems mm -hmm. and stuff like that uh i just nerd out on tech in general but um i i came across CRISPR, and like since then and then i think it was then a few years later about three years later I started reading articles about how you can basically order your own kit. And I was like, technology is moving wild. Like you can literally order your own kit and basically edit your own gene at home. And I was like, no, 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 no. I've got to, I've got to, I've got to understand what the hell is going on. And then, you know, fast forward a few years later or, you know, fast forward to now, um, mm -hmm. I finally said, you know what? I saw your thing and I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to catch this guy. And I'm going to get every single piece of information I can about this. And what was really fascinating to me as well is that you're 17, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, turning, I'm turning 18 in like seven days. August 10th is my birthday. So all right. All right. All right. Happy birthday for the future. Um, Thank you. And, uh, but, but yeah, technically you're 17 and yep. you are basically playing around with CRISPR. So I was like... I mean, kids these days, I mean, they're not on the Xbox. They're playing around with CRISPR. All right, all right. I see what we're playing. No, 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 no. <laughs> so please, please give me some background to that. How exactly did you find yourself in there? Yeah, I mean, so tech. So actually, I joined this. I guess the reason I got into gene editing in the first place uh, is because I joined this program back in like September. So I'm not sure if you've heard of TKS or... The knowledge society yes i i've basically been through your your profile there i've seen actually your articles are really good and oh, I, shit. Okay. I listened to your talk on the podcast as well and oh, apparently okay. you've only been doing this for like eight months right or something like that yeah eight months yeah yeah yeah, yeah. interesting very interesting <laughs> yeah so um yeah so because of this program uh they basically like it's a 10-month program they introduce you to like a bunch of emerging technologies like ai quantum computing like i, I blockchain like i haven't even mm. heard these technologies before mm. right but and also gene editing so uh basically because of that i dived into G gene editing uh and they have like this sort of a process you follow so in the beginning you just like learn about gene editing you write like an article on it so that's why i wrote an article on like prime editing i don't know if you, I don't know if you saw that one uh and then after that you do an experiment so like I did that CRISPR thing at home. I made a video on it and I also yeah. made an article on it. Yeah. And then after that, you also like do a review, so like a review paper. So you like research a topic about gene editing, for instance. You write an article on it and make a video on it. So mm -hmm. I looked into how we can use CRISPR-Cas13 as both a diagnostic and a potential treatment for COVID-19. Um, yes. A lot, a lot of big words there, but yeah. <laughs> it's fine. And, uh, I, 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 I'll I keep up as much as possible. If I've got any questions, I will definitely ask. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> drop, drop, yeah, yeah. Um, and, then, and then, like, the last thing is you actually, like, with the knowledge we just have, actually, like, make something new. Mm. So my, my idea was uh, using CRISPR-Cas9 uh, to create peanuts that don't cause allergies. Yes. Um, so I have a nut allergy. And like without 
if, if I if I, could, if I could just try peanut butter, like everyone like talks so, so highly about peanut butter, like it's so awesome. And stuff. Actually, like, yeah, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna um, dig it any harder. But I basically PBJ man is the way forward, PBJ? bro. <laughs> okay. It's okay. it's the way forward, man. Uh, I I I, I know you're friends. That's uh, it's Nufri, right? Is that how you say it? Nufri, yes. Yeah, Nufri, it's yeah. a really interesting project, man. I I like the idea of it. Yeah, we're trying to actually like uh, put it forward and stuff. It's uh like. It's been kind of slow right now, like progress wise, but once we actually like find a lab and I'm going to uni next year, right? So I'll, I'll have a bunch of access to like mm, labs and professors mm. and stuff. And I'm going to a food university that like, they specialize in food, University of Guelph. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity for me like to, you know, actually explore that idea further and That's actually insane. build it out. So that, that, would, that would be pretty insane. Yeah. That is insane. Um, but anyways, back to, back to the CRISPR kit. So how I even got started with that. So I was just basically just looking around like, you know, what are some experiments that I can do and stuff? And then I ran into this website called The Odin. Uh, and The Odin, they sell all these, like, kits and stuff. And you mm -hmm. mentioned, right, you found these kits. Yeah, I, I've seen thing, that Odin, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Funny thing about The Odin is that a lot of people find them really controversial, like, obviously, right? Yes, yes. Um, and, like, it's not actually, like, a normal thing to, like, be selling, like, CRISPR to, like, the public and stuff. Like, that's something, like, this guy who founded the Odin had to go through like a bunch of like hurdles like through and stuff. Mm -hmm. I think he like lost his like job or whatever. Cause like people were like, you know, like super skeptical about him. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so, so he started this company and he started like doing all these things. And um, so far it's been, I mean, going pretty well for him. His company is still a thing. Like uh, I can like buy these kits off of him and, you know, like actually do these experiments. Uh, but yeah, it is, it is a bit controversial and stuff. It is. I believe there's a lot more vendors doing it now though. Um, a lot more are people they? are, um, yeah, there, there are a lot more people like um, selling CRISPR kits, and just because of the, just because of I think how easy it is to produce, um, how easy it is to produce them, like, just as proteins. I think uh, I can't remember now. I'll probably have to do, do some research after this and point some to you. But I know a lot of like a lot of manufacturers in China just make it for companies because oh. a lot of yeah, because basically a lot of um, pharmaceuticals and even biotech companies are literally just playing around with CRISPR like constantly. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but it's interesting. I, I guess I guess Odin was the was the only resource you had access to. Yeah, at I mean, the for time, the public is for the public basically. Yeah, like for like companies and stuff. Of course, they mm. have their own like CRISPR vendors and whatever. But for the public, the only one I really know of that makes it like accessible is is the Odin so far. Yeah, I don't know. But if you have if you find others, like sure, send them over. Yeah, yeah, I definitely will do. Um, I I I think I was researching into this quite a while back. I found I I mean it's just what really baffled me was just how easily accessible it was and um it was just <laughs> i think it was crazy and the thing is i don't have any i don't think i have any close friends that are necessarily playing around with crispr because if i did i'd probably have injected a few bits into myself by now so i think that's a good thing i think it's a good thing that yeah. i don't have any friends that are that are um yeah uh, that are actively doing it but but yeah, if I if I do come to Cor uh, to Toronto and I and I and I give you a shout, just say no. Um, just 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 say no because I'll definitely <laughs> get right. I'll definitely be injecting myself with something there. Um, yeah, yeah, no, so you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. I was going to come to the topic of biohacking. So yeah, uh, when I learned about um, CRISPR, I then started digging into the whole concept and understanding the whole idea of biohacking. And I think that's the reason why I mentioned about injecting it in myself is uh, obviously as a as a pseudo joke, but um. What really fascinates me is the idea that we as humans have the ability, you know, we've always had it, I guess, and we've always been doing it to some degree, right? We've always been sort of hacking our, our own sort of genetics, um, right from right and from time. Other genetics too, like other, yeah, like we would like farmers breeding specific animals, exactly and animals and uh, and food as well. But um, mm -hmm. now that we're doing it on ourselves, um, the idea of biohacking has been one that's really fascinated me. So for me personally, the only forms of biohacking that I think I actively do would be, uh, let's say, physical fitness. Let's say, for example, going to the gym, I do calisthenics, I do Thai boxing. So I guess stuff like, you know, the fact that I'm having to like punch a bag or punch an object or punch someone's shin and then that, you know, I, I break my calluses and I reform them, that strengthens it. That is to a degree a form of biohacking, right? Uh, but then I think the more active forms of biohacking I do would be stuff like cold thermogenesis. When I like immerse myself in cold water or like, like near cold or like ice water mm -hmm. to basically, um, or I do some breathing techniques, for example, to like, you know, boost my, um, my vagal, my vagal nerve and increase my vagal tone, my, you know, my alertness and calm myself down, all that stuff. Or even stuff like, let's say water fasting, right? For like two or three days, just to, you know, to, 
to basically tell your body to do something that it's not normally doing. For me, these are like active forms of biohacking I do. But then there are people like you who are, like I said, who are playing basically with the actual like biology of it, right? So how do you see what you're doing? Like, I know at the moment, obviously, um, Nufri, for example, is still closer to the GMO side of things, right? But mm. then coming to stuff like Blasteria, where you're, <laughs> where you're actually, at this point, injecting, um, you know, Cas9 um, properties into someone's body and then blasting it with um, ultrasound waves that actually create some sort of chemical reaction, which then turns into a physical reaction and so sort of, you know what I mean? At that level, you're actually not just biohacking in terms of going to the gym, you're actually biohacking in terms of changing the, the, the person's, um, basically just the way the human actually functions. Yeah, I don't know if you've thought about this, but like, what, what do you, yeah, exactly. So I'll let you take it from there. What, how do you see what you're doing in regards to the biohacking spectrum? Yeah, um, so I guess like for, for, you mentioned Blasteria. So Blasteria um, doesn't actually use gene editing or, or Cas9. Uh, like Blasteria is just for like treating antimicrobial resistant infections. So like, let's say a bacteria you have, right, doesn't, it's not affected by like this antibiotic you're taking from the doctor. Mm -hmm. So you have to use stronger antibiotics, but at some point those bacteria will become resistant to that antibiotic creating a super bug in the end. And like the whole world will get, it's basically like a bacterial pandemic, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I get it. I get the whole point is you guys want to pre yeah. prevent the next COVID, right? <laughs> yeah. Prevent the next COVID, but like bacteria. Yeah. Yes. So for that, it, I wouldn't really call that biohacking in a sense. Uh, that's more like a, a medical treatment. That's more of a treatment. I, think, uh, I see. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's more of a treatment. Yeah, yeah. And there's no, there's no CRISPR or Cas9 involved. It's just literally like using ultrasound waves to like destroy the bacteria like physically. Um, but yeah, so in terms of biohacking, I would say, um, like, yeah, I, I would say I'm kind of like wary about that. I haven't like actually delved into like biohacking like on humans specifically, just because it's like so like even right now, like the only like I think approved clinical or the thing in clinical trials right now for actual like. Uh, CRISPR like you know uh, um, therapeutics is actually like um like sickle cell you know sickle cell anemia yeah sickle cell and yeah yes. so um that they're using CRISPR to basically like treat that right now mm -hmm. uh, and that's in clinical trials so I think other than that like that's pretty much been the only thing so far within the entire like space of like CRISPR on like humans that's like actually in clinical trials and getting ready for like actual like FDA approval um which actually speaks a lot to the fact that like there's a lot of like I guess, uh, like caution with using CRISPR yeah. and like actually on humans, because the thing with sickle cell, like in theory, it's obvious, right? Like just take CRISPR, edit the genes, make the, you know, one base pair that mutated into like a different base pair, boom, you're done. But in reality, there's so many other things that I play that we have like almost like no idea about. Mm -hmm, and like mm -hmm. they've run the sickle cell trial on like so many animal models, so many whatever, like water models that they found a sort of like protocol that just works right now. And like, because of that, they're just, Doing that in the clinical trials, but that takes a lot of time for like a lot of other like things, right? So solving like you know, um, whether it be like um, I don't know, like Down syndrome is an example, or like Alzheimer's or whatever, whatever genetic syndromes are out there, like even like I don't know, like cancer for instance. Yeah. Um, that takes a lot more time because like yeah, obviously like even for like Nufri, it sounds really simple, right? Like just take the genes that cause allergies in peanuts, edit them out with CRISPR. On paper, it sounds really fine, but in theory, there's so many other like no, sorry, not theory, in practicality. There's so many like different factors at play that we have like no idea about and they can only really like come out and show their true colors when like you're actually doing it like in the lab. Yeah. Um, so I would say um, in terms of like right now, it's, I would say there's a lot of comfort in a sense with like editing like non-human uh, like 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 organisms. But uh, in terms of when it comes to the human space, I think um, even like I haven't even like really delved into like CRISPR for humans as, as such mm, uh, because mm. it is like a really really like gray area yes. um there's a lot of there's a lot of debate on like you know even like I, I think even the TED talk you mentioned was was it Jennifer Dowd now yes yes speaking, like, Jennifer the, yeah, yeah, yeah 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 so at the end she mentioned that their next step was to have like committees and like talk about like the, the future of like CRISPR and like humans and stuff mm -hmm. and that TED talk was in 2015 right yes they still haven't made much progress since 2015 well that, um, just, there's just yeah. a lot of bureaucracy when it comes to that right and we live in a system yeah. that is just so complex and I mean thank god for AI now and hopefully running into the future but there's just too many redundancies and there's too many friction allowing such things to happen yep. so um so it makes sense but then again you do understand that there's also the the availability of it just means that 
um, you can't regulate it. <laughs> like it's it's kind of it's, it's yeah. quite difficult. I don't know if you heard the story of the of the CRISPR baby that was born, and yeah, I think I it was in, in China, and then it mm-hmm. and then there was some. I don't know if it's rumors or, or whatever, but then it got oh, missed. It got missing. I, I mean, the bit of it getting missing, like the, oh, the, the, yeah, okay. and like because of, I think that the the apparently the the government or the 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 authorities were coming to the lab and then the, the the guy had to go hide the baby or whatever and then now no one really knows where he is so it's like there's like little things like that and then there's also a documentary series on netflix that talks about the biohacking thing i don't know if you've seen it uh it's sure it's enough. really interesting man because there's this guy who basically works for nasa and in that process i think they were doing something about like because nasa as well working with crispr to sort of um i guess when it comes to like long duration space missions um obviously we want to protect humans going into space we've learned that from the 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 humans that have been to space and come back and the ones that even died from like radioactive like you know effects so we're trying to find ways in which we can use um biotech to um to at least in some way protect human beings from radiation and all this stuff right when we go to space so i think within that realm i think he was working within something within the field there and eventually he got obsessed with it and started injecting it on himself. I, I'm literally, I'm going to send a documentary to you it's on Netflix. Okay, okay. And it's got serious because it's not just him. It goes through about five or seven different people playing with CRISPR. One guy basically had like a, a, a kernel of dogs, about seven, ten dogs. And he was just sort of, only God knows what he was doing. Just like doing different things with CRISPR. But this guy though, the NASA guy, eventually obviously left NASA and started his own thing where he actually got a group of people who want to just play around the CRISPR and basically started his own company or, or, or community or community or wherever it is and there's a like group of people genuinely like scientifically and intellectually playing around with this but obviously he's actually injecting it himself you know he's trying to you know make himself stronger or have cells that are immune to certain things but and this is just the stuff that we know. Like, if you think about it, like, you're, um, not, you're, yeah. you're not the only guy that has access to Odin, right? Like, yeah. so anyone, anyone at all has access. And this is where the, I guess, the ethical question comes. Like, when it comes to biohacking, the one thing that, uh, you know, our, our ego and our mortality always comes in front of it. Always, you know, we always have our own needs and the things that we want. So as much as, you know, you might not be thinking about it, as much as, you know, someone like Jennifer might be thinking about the ethics of it, there are people out there who are just like, I'm just going to do this for myself. So what do you think about that? Like how, when you think about the future of it, like how wild do you see it? I mean, yeah, it is, it is kind of inevitable like mm. now that it's out there that people will just start doing their own sort of like thing. Um, in terms of like, I, I think at some point, like, it's like, um, so it's like if a new drug comes out, like like Tylenol, right, or something. Like it's like you can like use Tylenol however you want. You can read the dosage instructions. You can not read the dosage instructions. Like up to you. Yeah, right? yeah. At the end, it's up to like you and like your own stupidity to like take more than a dosage and like end up like you know harming yourself in the process, right? So I, th- I think the same pro- thing applies to like CRISPR as well. Of course, CRISPR is a bit different because yeah, actually, like okay, so I guess it's a bit different in the sense that if you had access to like embryos and stuff then you could create like long lasting changes for like the rest of like humanity or whatever yeah uh, but if you just like edit like your own like sort of like genes and stuff and like just like in your like somatic cells the cells that don't get transferred on to like the next generation mm-hmm. then you're not really like com- you're not really causing like that much harm just you're causing harm to yourself like sort of like the Taliban situation um so i think there there'll be people who are just stupid and like think that oh if i see i saw this in the news that it says that, oh super, super strength and like super, super yeah super, super, yeah, yeah. Yeah, be those people for sure, right? They'll be them for sure, and I think, of course, um, yeah. I think, I think, I think we, we might even see CRISPR as like a new, like, if that was the case, like, as, as like a new street drug in the future, that's just inevitable, right? Like, people yeah. taking this, like, yeah, whatever. Um, but that, I think that might be the reality. But on the flip side, there might be people who actually like understand what they're doing, and it's sort of like making it more like open source. Like, when, when things go open source, right? Like, there's a lot of good things that happen, a lot of bad things mm-hmm, that happen. Mm-hmm. But on the bad side of things, that's inevitable, but there are also like positives of that, right? So there might be people out there experimenting on their own on in whatever labs without, you know, whatever regulation. And they might actually have some like positive outcomes. Um, like you never know, right? Like someone actually might find a way to treat like cancer cells using CRISPR Cas9 or something. Yeah, like, you know, someone yeah. like me, or whatever, finds a way to make like hypoallergenic peanuts. Like I, I don't have like a university lab or whatever. I'm just like, a kid at home, right? Yeah. Um so stuff like that is like sort of a more on the positive side of things. So I see like there's like a both a, a, a negative side to it and a positive side to it. 
Um, and I think like making it like now that it's just out there, like like the Odin, for instance, right? Uh, it's things are inevitably going to go wrong, and they're also at the same time inevitably also bound to go right. If mm, that makes sense. Mm. So, no, no, I definitely, no, definitely, I agree with that. Um, I was just going to say actually, just for because I know CRISPR as a gene editing tool. It's a protein um, that can be used to basically precision. Um, like basically, you can just send it information, and you can basically go in there and do exactly what you tell it to do, right? Well, that is just me describing it in the most basic way. So, yeah. um, how how would you describe CRISPR for just anyone who just wants to know what CRISPR is? Yeah, I would say CRISPR. Uh, there's an awesome analogy. If you th if you can think about uh, like the find and cut function on your computer, it's basically like that, but for your genes. So like, um, you would input whatever like you know string you wanted or whatever not string, but like um whatever like. You know, sentence you wanted to cut out of, of like your paper you put that into the function the function finds it and just cuts it right out so with CRISPR it's the same thing instead of inputting like a you know a, a words or whatever you, you would input you know RNA guide RNA and that would essentially guide the Cas9 protein to wherever you wanted to go like in the genome that matches that RNA sequence and then it just cuts at that spot pretty much and there's different types of you know CRISPRs but CRISPR Cas9 the most basic one mm. all it does is it goes and looks for like one place that or places that match the sequence it has and it makes a uh, it makes a double stranded cut uh, in, in the DNA basically so um, it's basically like a find and cut mechanism and it's like I guess genetic scissors if that makes sense yeah would you uh, uh, thanks for that but would you say that it's just cutting like can you say for example that you use CRISPR to send information somewhere, if that makes sense. So to the to the to the to the gene. So you know how, for example, you want to cut out a cell that has sickle cell, right? You can go there, CRISPR mm -hmm. does that. But can you use CRISPR as a filler and say, all right, I want you to go repair something as opposed to like just cutting it out. Like let's say yeah, I want so you to I merge to, to with something, for example. Yeah, so I think what you're trying to say is like if you can if you can add in like like your own sort of gene, right? So you cut out this mm. one gene that's like that is a, a mutant gene that causes you know whatever cancerous effects. Mm. And you sub that in with like a proper like you know um, yeah. actually like natural gene. So yeah, you can do that. Um, CRISPR-Cas9 is again just the most basic model. All of this is just cuts. Yeah. Um, there's different ways like with prime editing, for instance, which is like they call it CRISPR 2.0. It just came out like recently, I think one or two years ago now. Interesting. Um, but but what what it does is it uses um, Again, the same sort of mechanism. It finds it finds the area you want to cut. It makes a single stranded cut in one of the strands. It removes that strand, and it has this like it's kind of complicated, but basically it adds in like a different strand that you wanted to into that like area. Um, so if I wanted to, instance, you know, uh, hypothetically, if I if I hated my eye color and I wanted like brown eyes, yeah, uh, like theoretically, I'm not saying this is like a good thing to do, but like you could basically, you know, um, cut that gene for like, you know, the black eye color out and put like the gene for- Yeah, brown. I was reading about this, like designer babies and stuff that people can yeah. actually do that because you can like identify it even within the embryo level as well and sort mm -hmm. of even like program what your, what your kid can be. And I think, again, I think it's raised a lot of ethical questions, right? Like oh, the future, but then I think the future is going to be so wild because you just mentioned like open source uh, with things becoming a lot more decentralized, with resources yep. being abundantly available. I think it's, it's almost inevitable, man. I think we're genuinely going to be, um, we're going to be transhuman. Like we're going to be walking around and like some people would just be like, I don't know, just have like incredible eyesight and just see like straight to the surface of the moon or something like that. It's just, <laughs> it's been insane. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I think, I think um, that reality of like some people like having like, like crazy, whatever, I feel like um, it, it'd be, it'd be very, it'd be very hard to, to get such a like thing done. Cause right now, like, like I said, right, the current pace is like just with like sickle cell anemia, like they took so long just to like get it to clinical trials and stuff. Um, I can't imagine someone doing like, the same thing for something completely different, like within like a year or two. Oh no, of like, course not, man. Definitely yeah. not. By no means, yeah. man. I think, um, and what, when I make a mention of this, I think maybe in, in like a hundred years or something, um, oh, yeah, where that yeah. would be the case. But um, but even much quicker than that. The only reason I say, like I said, because of how decentralized it is, um, yeah. because progress can happen much more if, uh, exponentially when it's happening. Like look at look at the space industry, like. When it was just authorities looking after it, it was moving so slow, and then all of a sudden you open it up, and the the the, the growth is exponential. So I think that's what it is. Like you know, the 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 less it seems like the less controlled the space is, 
of course, the more <laughs> the more dangerous it sort of becomes because there's uh, there's different players in the game. But um, I think the growth becomes a lot more exponential. Now you've got stuff like you know advancements in robotics as well, which when you combine it with biology and then you've got AI as well, I think it just supercharges growth, which is which is pretty insane. But oh, yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I was gonna say, all right. This, if we if we take a step back now, just gonna get um. Obviously, I I've never met you before, so who's Gibran and what is it that you do? <laughs> yeah, I guess um, I guess so. Ever since like I always thought everyone, but I guess ever since grade two, uh, I've always had this dream of like working in a lab, and like I still have the exact same dream since grade two. Nice. Um, I guess I used to watch like a bunch of Bill Nye the Science Guy. And like MythBusters and all these people like doing like you know cool stuff in the lab and whatever. Um, so I've always wanted to be that person mixing like two like liquids and like creating something like you know some like explosion or whatever. Like just imagine that. Nice. Here, right? um, <laughs> but I guess uh, and like um, yeah, I, like, I don't really care what I'm doing. Like it could be you know you know CRISPR like for cancer, or it could even be like how can I make cows stop farting so that they don't contribute to climate change? Like something like really crazy like that. So I don't I don't really care like what I'm working on as long as I'm in the lab and like doing something really, really cool. So that's what I enjoy. Um, I love like nature and stuff. Like I go off for like a bunch of like na nature hikes, I guess. Um, love walking like on nature. Like I think I, and I also, I guess one fun fact about me, I am learning Japanese right now. Um, really? So, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Japanese, I guess. Uh, yeah. Konnichiwa. That Konnichiwa. Yeah. yeah. Konnichiwa. Yeah. 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 And, so and I, uh, I think the other word I know is Baka. But that's just from Baka? anime. Yeah, it's like I don't know. I don't, it's even, like, I don't even know. It's like bro. it's like it's like idiot or stupid yeah. or something like that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is the thing. This is the thing, man. I don't. I don't. I don't watch anime. I don't watch anime. Yeah, I, I learned. I learned that from anime. Definitely, you hear it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I don't watch anime because the thing is, when people hear I like I, I speak Japanese or like I learn Japanese, like oh, like you're one of like those anime kids and stuff, right? Yeah. Like, nah, I, man. I'm, I'm about to like Japanese culture. Like I actually wanna like my goal is to like one day like go and actually like live in Japan. And like you know, whatever and stuff. But like, yeah. So that's why I'm learning Japanese. I love Jap Japan and stuff. If everyone's from Japan, like watching this, it'd be pretty cool. That's awesome, <laughs> man. Now you sound like my yeah. sister because she's exactly the same. She's a she's a film producer and she just yeah. loves Japan. She doesn't watch animes, but she's just like she just loves the culture and she wants to be there. <laughs> yeah, I I, I yeah, completely understand exactly. what you mean. Yeah, it's a pretty yeah. it's it's a very I like I like the city as well. Like it's very modern. Um, we're talking about recently about uh, I was talking to a friend about the the road networks, how optimized they are. Um, oh, yeah. because it's quite modern um, and we're referring uh, we're talking about it in regards to a specific bacteria uh, or, or sorry algae and what the algae does it sort of spreads itself out thin um, to look for food and it's sort of got this like sort of threads and networks that it uses to spread itself out thin and so if it finds food it sort of sends the food through the you know back to the source and um, I think if when, when they modeled that, um, that that algae they realized that the algae's um, network is actually super optimized so they were using it to compare to cities and road networks within cities and for example when they modeled it against london london was just shit like london yeah. was just <laughs> not optimized at all but japan came out really top like and apparently wow. they, they yeah apparently they actually modeled their city using models from that from that algae and i'll, I'll have to find it and send it over to you as well so you can see I'll, I'll put so it up random, on here. So cool. It is very, very random and very cool. Uh, you have fun in Japan, man. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I will, I will, man. I love Japan. Oh, what are the things that sort of drive you towards Japanese culture or Japan in general? I mean, I love. So this is one thing me and my friend always like say, like the Japanese know how to compose. So whether it be movies, whether mm. it be music, mm. whether it even be food, mm. like Japanese like composition, whatever it is, man. I'm telling Interesting. you, like I've I've gotten myself into like Japanese music, but not like, you know, anime openings and all that stuff. No, no, no. I'm talking like, like Japanese jazz, like hits different. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you've heard of city pop. You've heard of city pop? I love Japanese city pop. I, I, you know city pop? Hey, I'm, hey, I'm hey. way too obsessed with Japanese city pop. I mean, I, when I mean, I, I just, that's all I can say, man. I'm, I'm way too obsessed with it. <laughs> yeah, like, like all Japanese music. Right? Like, oh, bro, I'll bro, I'll have to, I'll have, genuinely have to send you a few, man. Like if that's, if that is yeah. really where we're at, like, I yeah, have to yeah, send yeah, you a few. Yeah. Like my Spotify is literally just filled with them right now. No, um, way, no way. bro, it's what? it's really really <laughs> awesome, man. I I I really like it, man. It has a very it's uplifting. Awesome. It's just so uplifting, man. I love it. And especially Who's the, your favorite artist? Who's your favorite artist? Um, so the one I'm listening to right now is Teiko um, Onu Onuki. 
Um, and the, oh, and this oh, Teko Onuki. Teko Onuki. So I'll see if I can. I'll type it in here so you can see. Okay. Um, and the song is called. I, it literally, it's just because I don't tend to listen to albums. I tend to find like a a, a few songs. Oh, Onuki. And the song is called Four A.M. It's a fuck. It's a beautiful song, man. <laughs> it's a it's a yeah. it's a beautiful beautiful song I, and that's I've never heard of this yeah I tend to listen I, I like the city pop obviously from like the seventies and eighties like I I really like them like it's just it's just, it slaps it slaps like like they have really a lot does. of like bass guitar and stuff that bass really guitar does. always always slaps have you heard of a like ran, also random but like have you, have you heard of a Cassiopeia Cassiopeia Mid gems like yeah like they uh, they have this awesome album it, it's it's instrumental I wouldn't even like really call it like a uh, city pop but it's like uh it's more like it's, it's more instrumental but they're that they're actually mm. the ones that introduced me to city pop like honestly man interesting youtube algorithm is blessed <laughs> it blesses you with, with like stuff it's crazy youtube algorithm is blessed like i think like cultivating your like youtube algorithm to like give you like awesome stuff should yeah be skill you're putting resume, honestly. it is no for real man for real but the thing i find for myself especially with youtube is because i'm so all right, I, I'll describe myself as just like as a knowledge seeker, right? I like to seek knowledge yep. and I like to share it. So what that ends up leading to is that there are times, there are moments in time when my algorithm is so... All right, my, my algorithm is curated for the stages I'm in. But then mm. what, that, what happens with that is that there is this, um, there is this like trans, transitional phase that's just so difficult. It, yeah, is, yeah, yeah. it is, especially like, I'll, des I'll describe that as right now, because I open YouTube and I just hate it. I just turn it off. I'm like, I don't want to be here right now. Yeah, I know <laughs> because I, know I have those transition and transitional stages where, because at the moment I'm doing, a, I'm learning a lot of stuff like uh, neuroscience and neurobiology. And, um, uh, but then before that, I was learning a lot of stuff to do with um, behavioral economics. So I open YouTube and I'm still seeing a lot of, you know, behavioral economics related stuff. I'm seeing stuff with economic modeling. Oh, yeah. But then I was like, ah, oh, it's, it's not quite, know, it's not, it's not that. hitting. <laughs> I get that, I get that, I yeah. get that so much. I get that so much, yeah. Like, especially like when you go through like a phase where you just watch memes for, for some reason. True. And like your whole face full, full of memes now. That's and why I've got four really, really different bad. accounts. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's, that's good. That's good. That's good. You should do that. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, that's why I've got four different accounts just for the memes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I was going to, I was going to ask actually, um, when you, because you did your, you did your, um, you did your CRISPR video quite recently. So essentially, you, you have your own DIY lab, right? So I just wanted to... Uh, yeah, that's what I call it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it basically is. I mean, what's happened is... And this is actually one of the things that I really love about tech and about what I do is I keep on understanding how technology and technology, not just meaning computers, just technology in terms of human advancement is allowing the individual to be so independent and powerful and you know be able to like make max a lot more impact right and in this case you've been able to basically bootstrap your projects yourself right um be a blasteria new free or you know this little video you just did about the crispr so i mean how how did you how did technology allow you to build your own you know diy lab how would you say that was possible I, okay so i guess i mean like for instance, there's this tool that I would have never gotten access to called Benchling. Uh, so Benchling is basically for designing plasmids. So when I was doing like new free and stuff, um, and even a bit of like my my Odin CRISPR kit video, um, Benchling is basically a platform where you can grab like plasmids. So plasmids are like these circular rings of DNA um, that like you would you can insert into like bacteria for instance and they would like do cool stuff so you mm. can give bacteria antibiotic resistance for instance like like in my lab um or like in the video uh, that you can basically insert into bacteria and now the bacteria has this like extra sort of like dna like it's kind of like um extra like drives for your computer like you know like external drives interesting plasma is like an external drive for your computer but like for, for a bacteria um so they have like their actual like you know proper genome oh wow. wait wait wait, wait, wait. sorry 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 i think that just yeah, yeah, yeah. it just clocked in my head that's actually wild wait, wait so you get a plasmid and you can feed it to bacteria and it's like an extension of the amount of like like memory sort of thing that they have or like yeah d uh, like sort of genetic information they can they can pass yeah, actually, Crazy. yeah, exactly. So and what's really interesting is that bacteria can pass genetic information uh, between other bacteria. So there's something called 
uh shit, what was it called i think it's called uh I, don't know, I forgot what it was called but there's basically um if one bacteria has antibiotic resistance like like a plasmid for that right they can clone that plasmid within them and they can pass that plasmid on through like this like bridge that they form between two bacteria uh, called the pilus and they can pass that through like to the next bacteria and now the other bacteria has antibiotic resistance which is why like antibiotic resistance is such a like a it spreads so rapidly because they can pass the mm. genetic information between them mm. so yeah like you can like, and plasmids are crazy like that's that's how we're pretty much doing new for you you design a plasmid um that well actually sorry not not new free but uh like for instance if you wanted to give bacteria like the power to like you know i don't know like uh, like, like again like to glow resistance. glow green for oh, yeah. example glow green. Glow green, exactly. <laughs> i know a lot of people do yeah. that <laughs> yeah yeah it's a very it's a very very basic uh, like the fundamental experiment you yeah. Can, yeah you can you can have that gene for like uh green fluorescent protein gfp in that one plasmid and you would put that like in a dish full of like bacteria and they would basically like absorb that plasmid just like from like the the external environment and they would have you know that gene as a like, part of their genome and then boom wow yeah. So I think uh, so. Yeah, back back to benchling, I, I guess. So for so benchling basically allows you to design these plasmids. Like they literally have like the entire like gene sequence. It's like A C C G G G G whatever whatever, right? Um, and you can basically like design your own plasmid. You can get plasmids from this website called AddGene.com um, and base or dot org. I don't know, but AddGene, uh, and you can look for a plasmid, for instance, that is for E. coli or for. Uh, like I don't know, um, streptococcus, like pneumonia, or some some like other other bacteria, basically. And you can configure them. And you can find genes that do certain things, and you can just plug and play pretty much. Uh, and you can make your own plasmid. So for for that ex uh, example, for new free, we had to make a um, a plasmid that would basically you know take the the genes that cause uh, allergies in peanuts and remove them. So we had to use like for instance you know um, our uh, benchling to like create that plasmid. So I guess tech helped us out in that way. Of course, like. Just in, just in general, like I think, like the biggest thing, um, especially in science, not not only like um, like AI and like whatever, like like tech space, um, is that like research? Like research is open, like yeah, the internet, right? Yes. it's crazy, freaking it's stupid. Like I, I like I'm, I, it's funny thing because I'm going to university like this year, and we, I actually have a class that I took that specifically looks into like, do we even need a university degree anymore? And like mm, the class mm. is literally called Hey Google because you can ask Google anything nowadays, right? Yeah, like yeah. Like, why do you have to learn history when you can just ask, like, Google, like, okay, like, who is this person, this world war or whatever? Well, well, yeah, yeah. Right? Like, Google knows. Yeah. So uh, basically, like, because of the Internet, uh, I was able to learn basically, like, how to create plasmids, how to how does CRISPR work, like, just watching YouTube videos. So I would say that was probably the biggest thing mm. that helped me out because before mm. the Internet, you would have to go to university, actually study, understand this shit like your own. But like in a yeah. week, you can get to like the level of like, you know, months of education that a university student gets. Of course, there's not like that level of depth. You're getting like surface level education. Yes. But you still have like 20%. If it's like a, if it's like, if it's like a hundred percent like of like information you can have, right? Let's say 20% of the information you can get just straight off the internet. And like the rest of the 80% you have to study at university, right? What happens is that most of that 80% is, isn't really necessary for like the labs or whatever you're actually doing. You really only like need that 20% of information. And of course, now it's not the full picture, but it is what, you will get you through pretty much, right? That's what the internet will do for you. Yeah, um, it's actually interesting you said that because um, talking about the university, actually, I believe, so I, I went to, I, I tried uni twice and I dropped out twice, right? Mm -hmm. But I was, comp I was studying computer science. So for stuff like computer science, I realized that I could literally learn that myself. Um, yeah. And I believe that you can even, like you said, you can even get 100% of depth, um, not just a 20 or 80. Like you can get 100% of depth outside the university environment. And there, there, there are a lot of courses and a lot of um, industries or um, uh, I guess fields that you, you might not even need the uni for. I, I was having a conversation recently that I basically concluded in saying that universities can play a much better role as... Uh, as a community and as a space that allows you to explore your ideas, right? So rather than being this hub where you find information, which clearly a lot of the information you get at universities are quite dated anyways, because you've mm -hmm. basically got real-time information on Google. Like, <laughs> yeah, so, exactly, yeah. um, so the, the universities sh can't, um, should not be priding themselves on the part of like the teaching part of things. Because I think, again, when it comes to learning, there's so many different learning styles. Um, Okay. Honestly speaking, you know, I, I, I've sat in lectures in, in, in over 10, 10, to, 10, to, 10 to 100 hours of lectures, right? And you just, I don't know if I'm sitting there to learn or if I'm sitting there just to tick a box that I have been there. Because yeah. honestly speaking, 
I learned just from like, you know, like I said, reading a research paper, um, uh, you know, watching a YouTube video and like hands-on practicing it myself. So I think people can benefit a lot from just learning themselves. Of course, this comes with, you know, having more um, curated learning um, measures. This comes with having better research into how different people learn and different environments. Of course, we're going to need that. But I feel people can learn better learning themselves. And then university would just be, you know, think of it back in like times of like, you know, ancient Rome, where the university was just a place where people came to debate. You get what I mean? Like where you could then bring all that knowledge and then start synthesizing it and then start realizing, all right, what does this mean and what can we do with it? Uh, I feel that's a role that university might actually, I mean, we'll have to adapt to start um, providing to people. Yeah, I agree. I think I think for sure, like in your field, like like uh, in, in a computer field, like or like uh, you know coding and stuff, I feel like you can do that completely online. I still think we're we're a bit away from that, like in terms of like the science, like bio, biology and like scientific. Yeah, field, the hard because sciences, the information yeah. is a lot. Yeah, a lot, a lot less, a lot like less like computerizable. Because computer, like you can learn that, like you you can learn computer stuff from a computer like on the internet because it's all about like computers and stuff right um i don't even know that's like the reason but maybe um i don't know i just feel like that like bio information and like science information is a lot lot different of course than like you know computing and stuff um and but we're not like there yet in, in the sense that you can get a hundred percent information um just like off of youtube videos and stuff like i think i think we're still away a long way from like that um, yeah, but of course, like, do you have like even like uh, I don't know if you heard of a uh, Udemy or Ucademy? Yeah, it's Udemy. Udemy there's Coursera. There's yeah, Skillshare. Yeah. There's all these different exactly. places to learn you, stuff. You, you can get like a nano degree off of like Udemy for mm. like self driving cars, right? Like I know mm. someone that did that. Um, and like yeah, like they're legit now. And they're, they're, yeah. <laughs> they're legit. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And, yeah, like, they know they know all they need to know pretty much for like doing self driving cars or whatever. And yeah, he best part is he's like 14 years old. So wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think he's like the youngest guy to do there or something like that. Like, yeah, you That's wild. What are kids in these days? <laughs> no, yeah. It's crazy. It's actually crazy. It's, it's really crazy. But yeah. Yeah. I, Stuff like that. It, yeah. No, no, that's interesting because even, I think even right now we have the tools to do it. Like if you think of stuff like, um, you have like curated learning paths, right? Like you say, there's a, there's a course, for example, and someone actually spends the time to like describe it. And we've got technology already, like stuff like HoloLens and stuff like Oculus, right? Where you can literally create more immersive environments. And then you've got stuff like the ability to build a DIY lab, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I could literally sit in here, wear my Oculus, right? And watch a lecture, like an interactive lecture, and literally be in my lab right there and I'm learning. Right. And that in itself, yeah. I can, of course, not 100 percent, but perhaps 50 to 70 percent. I could, as a biologist, I could potentially learn or even even a even someone who is, you know, studying medicine as well. I mean, they could even potentially learn much quicker that way. And that would be a lot more optimized. But of course, yeah. I mean, we don't we don't have that at the moment. So, <laughs> yeah, but I think I think it's fine because because like that 100 percent of information like most of it is just like supplementary information that will maybe help you in one way or another, like brainstorm, like innovate, like on new ideas. Right. Mm, if you just want to mm. like get yourself through and like understand the basics and just like, you know, be able to like, because that 20% or whatever percent it is of knowledge that you will learn from the internet is like 80% of the information you will be using constantly. Right. Like the Pareto's, Pareto's principle, like 20% um, of what you do is like 80% which 80 80 percent what you do is like 20 percent what you know something like that um but like just because you're not that 20%, what's it what's it called again the principle the the Pareto Pareto's principle okay? Pareto's yeah 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 Pareto's principle it's actually like it's everywhere it's it's actually crazy it's fine um, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah i'll, I'll yeah, dig yeah. it up <laughs> yeah so so like i feel like it, like even because even though you can't learn all that in like you know 100 percent information um you can still get by fine and i think you can um excel because you're not going to be wasting time right like learning all of that information like four years like let's say you take one year to like get yourself through like just like the most relevant information that you need just to, like get you know get going and stuff versus like four eight years of just like learning like every single nuance and detail that you're not really going to be using all the time it's helpful obviously yeah yeah but it's not like you don't need it pretty much yeah yeah i think a lot of that stuff just sits down in your 
in your in the RAM of your system. Like it's exactly. not. <laughs> it's not really. It's not even the. I think it's the. Uh, it just sits in the. Is it the NV RAM? Like it's not even. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. It's exactly. not really being actively used at the moment as well. Oh. Well, yeah, that's 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 interesting. I was saying so. But the thing is, you can see right now, like it's actually possible for people to actually build their own lab. So so if you're someone who wanted to get into um, biotech, for example, right? Let's say so. What? All right. Think of it this way. With what you know right now, I know you've just started and of course there's just so much more to learn, right? And so much more to do. But if you were talking to yourself, say a year ago, right? About, you know, getting into CRISPR or just building your own lab, what, what sort of um, advice and what actual processes would you take to do it? Given what you know right now, what things would you do? Mm -hmm. I would say, I would say like, honestly, like the biggest thing for me is that like, it's possible. Mm. Um, and because mm. it's possible, like that just opens up like, like, wait, shit, like what? I can make my own lab. Wait, I can, you know, start building self-driving cars. Oh, wait, I can start making, you know, models that detect cancer from whatever. Like you, if you, I think that's the biggest realization for me is that you don't have to be like some like super smart person or whatever. Like you can be like, like there's a bunch of Steve Jobs core, right? Like everything around you is made up by people that were as ordinary as you are. They just took the extra step to like actually like yep. activate change and like actually like, you know, whatever it's just the mindset that differentiated them from like the from like the actual uh, very or, true. Other people. very true um so like yeah so i would say that's the biggest realization that i had other than that like the internet is really like pretty much all you need obviously like back to the 100 percent yeah yeah, yeah. Better, right i get but it. with the internet you can just watch i think i think the most valuable thing to get like sort of any like topic um or just like the like the workflow i do or whatever is just like First, I would just go online, search this like new topic, um, you know, like check out like the Google like news tab, like mm. just go on like, the feed and stuff. Like look at what's happening in the field, what, what's new and stuff, right? And then from there, look at some of the terms I saw like in the papers or something I, I have no clue about. I go on YouTube next because YouTube is awesome. Just for like getting intros into things, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And then from YouTube, you learn a lot about stuff and you, you can go more on YouTube and stuff. And then once you're done with YouTube, you kind of figure out like, you have a base understanding of it. Like go deep, like go on research favorite website, like go on Google Scholar, right? Go on whatever it is. There's just PubMed. tons of resources as well. Like there are like tons. so many dedicated websites that teach so many niche things that you can just like spend exactly. a week and just know it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I would say that um, if, I was, if I was giving myself advice, the one thing I would say is that like just you can do it. Like you have, just have the mindset that like, you can actually like do this like even with new free like if i was talking if i was you know talking about like, older self you would be like wait what like mm. peanuts like how how like where are you gonna get this lab from are you gonna but honestly you can just figure it out like everything is possible like people have done it that's how everything has been started like that's, that's that even like apple started in a garage right well they mm -hmm. didn't have like this huge factory they started with so everything started by people that were no more ordinary than you are um so that's the number one thing and then the other thing is just like use the internet like learn whatever you can uh and there's a lot you can learn there's too much to learn uh but you, you can yeah, learn very you, soon you can learn a lot you can learn a lot just with the internet honestly youtube is a superpower if you use it right it's not just for memes um it's for it's for like actually like you can find a lot of stuff so. I, I've, I've been hearing that as well recently i think youtube definitely is is powerful and that's why i i actually took the initiative to start my own channel as well because mm. um i found like there was just a i guess it's just a I felt like there was a need to just put, put out more intellectual content <laughs> because yeah, yeah. I just, yeah, I just kind of be done with the TikToks and the Instagram. Like it's all well and good, you know, I mean, they, they do what they do, but you know, like I think YouTube is great for finding um, intellectual and I guess um, useful, insightful con um, um, content. Yeah, for sure. hundred percent. And then how do you find it as well with your age group? So um, as someone who's 17, I mean, the average 17 year old, it's probably again like i said probably stuck on tiktok or it's not really you know i, I don't know maybe i'm maybe i'm wrong but i'm thinking maybe from the from my own head as my sorry when i was 17 what what people were like um just generally no sense of the future as such they sort of live in the now and stuff so how would how, how do you find that your mindset and the projects you're doing um align with your 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 peers yeah uh, i would say you kind of hit on the nail like a lot of my friends especially from school and stuff um are, are kind of like that like they're not like super you know whatever in the future um they are like usually on TikTok and whatever social media i've even asked some of them like you know like what like if you had 24 hours um like if if, if the last 24 hours or the next sorry the next 24 hours were the last 24 hours you had to live 
Like, what would you be doing, right? And that's kind of when that question basically gets like the desires out of you. Like, what do you actually want to do in life, right? Mm. And some of them said like sleep. Some of them said like you know I don't really know what I want to do. So I'm like, All oh right. man, uh, yeah. But I would say there are like a bunch of like off course like phenomenal people who are like in my age group and i found a lot of them through like twitter and you know linkedin and whatever um twitter is actually crazy but like twitter a bunch is. of these young people yeah <laughs> a bunch of young, young, young people like working on like crazy crazy things um and stuff but i would say for the majority like yeah they're not at all like doing these sorts of things it's kind of like they don't really have like their mindset is like you know i'll just go to university i'll you know have like a normal life whatever and that's normal like that's like that and that's that's fine like I you guess, can have yeah. a normal life and stuff yeah. and I, I respect that too um but yeah, there's some people that just like want to be like super ambitious like make mm. change in the world they don't want to live like a normal life because the thing with um medi mediocrity and like like just living a normal life is that it has competition because everybody's like in line for like you know getting like you know a job or like a regular job or like a house where there's a lot of competition there right yeah there's no not as much competition in the space where it's like start your own company because like there, you can't that doesn't even make sense or they like, like there's no mm. one like in line for you to start your own company you can just do that right now right? yes yes Whereas, like getting this job at this company that's like you need a university degree for you you have to be in line you have to be like oh what are your credentials what are whatever right so very i would true. say very there's true. a mediocrity where everyone else is going a lot more competition and that people that are sort of like have that mindset that they want to be different and they want to avoid that competition so actually a lot of people see that like starting your own company whatever is really risky but if you, if you think about it um, the higher you're actually mitigating risk because let's say like I want to get into um, like you know I want I want to start okay so let's say I want to get into university right um, so what's what's my best case scenario right now my best case scenario is I get into university my worst case scenario is you know maybe I'm like you know homeless or something maybe I'd, like I don't have a job whatever right <laughs> um, so that's my that's my worst case scenario that's my best case scenario now let me let me aim a bit higher right so if my best case scenario is like starting like a you know Fortune 500 company or whatever like like a billion dollar company right that's my, that's my best case scenario um and like what do i need to get to that best case scenario so basically i need you know i need like the mindset to get there i need like you know the knowledge like to get there like the skills and whatever i need like the, the network to get there i need like um like good character and stuff right so i have all these things that i have whereas in that previous scenario all i really had was like the knowledge because in university all you need is knowledge right they don't really care yep. about mindset yep. all these things right so all you need is knowledge but to get to that founder whatever thing you need knowledge mindset network all these things right so that's my best case scenario but if you think about it now, my worst case scenario is also in university. Just, yeah, 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 yeah. It's not, it's not being homeless anymore. My worst case scenario is university. So if all that fails, my Yo, now new worst true, case scenario true, is my best case true, scenario. Right? True, true, true. So when when people think about like having you know risky whatever, like you're actually mitigating risk because your worst that case is scenario very is true. much better. That is actually um, very very true. Yeah, that's very so true. That, that's one thing. That's one thing uh, I I've heard from actually like TKS. That's one thing they, they, they tell you in TKS. Um, but yeah, so I should shout out to TK. I, 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 I kind of stole it from them. But yeah, so that that's that's one thing. Um, but yeah, in terms of my friends, and, and honestly, like I don't judge my friend, friends or whatever peers or whatever, like just for for being like self centered Because honestly, like you, there's no like really, like you can live your life whatever how you want it. Like you can be like super chill and whatever. Nothing wrong with that. Um, but yeah, I would say like compared to my friends stuff, some of them call me like you know like a bit like extra like wow you're like doing so much like stuff like why are you like yeah you're, like, you're I know I know. Um, and I kind of, I kind of, I kind of like, you know, I, I, I see that, I see where they're coming from, but it's also like, you know, some people like just want to get ahead of the game early and stuff. I don't know. I found that what really helps is, you know, embedding yourself in the community, or at least a group of people who are similar and like, you know, similar minded. So I don't know how difficult is that for you? Like <laughs> to find those, of course, online makes it easy. Right. And you've got this um, yeah. TKS. So I'm guessing you already have that community there. But I don't know, I find it, I, I think maybe it's quite difficult to find intellectual people. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say too, because we're, we're, it's a minority, right? If, 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 mm. if the majority of people were intellectual, that would, we would be like miles ahead of, you know, whatever, like mm. where we are right now. But mm. um, I would say yeah, it, it's, it's challenging, especially like if you, if you don't know where to look, right? Because you might yeah. find like one or two on the street, whatever, but you can find a lot of people if you look in the right place. So like Twitter is awesome. Like, uh, that's one place you can find really really like smart people and twitter is great because once you start following one smart person you can see other smart people they yeah it sort of connects stuff, it right? yeah yeah so i would say actually like the, the online sense especially now with everything covid like you know even like this youtube channel you started i assume we did it you, you wouldn't have done it if covid wasn't there right um yeah i mean <laughs> in a sense in a yeah. sense I, I i don't know man i think i haven't really thought that deeply about covid in that sense um 
honestly speaking, I spent a lot of my the first lockdown initially when it all happened. I yeah. lo- I loved it because I was working then at a company and uh, for me, performance optimization is more of my biggest, like it's, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a nerd for performance optimization. Like if I can in, improve the performance of something, if it's like reduce, like, you know, if, if it takes 10 hours to do something and you can find out to reduce it to three, like, so it's like I was working yep. full time, working eight hours a day. And then I'm like, wait, I, surely I can cut this down. Like, and eventually I was able to optimize my time. So I'm like, I'm doing, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing that bit of work in a lot less time than eight hours. And I was like, well, I've got way more time to do my own thing, which is exactly what I wanted. So it's like, so I was able to then start doing more stuff anyways. And I really loved it. I think I, I found, I really enjoyed lockdown because I was just able to, like, you know, <laughs> do a lot of yeah, things, yeah, yeah. a lot of things that maybe I couldn't do before when the world was moving too fast. So I haven't really nice. thought too much about the lockdown per se. I think the, this YouTube channel has just been like a natural evolution of this project spare time I've been working on. Uh, and the whole goal is just to, um, to like I said, to, to, to learn and synthesize that information and share that with people and connect with more people, mm-hmm. just gather information, gather resources and be able to connect it to people in a, in a sort of optimized way so that people can find the information they need. And so, yeah, it's almost like me um, in, infusing that sort of performance optimization with yeah. syst- with systems architecture to find a way to get information <laughs> through a tube. Yeah, and YouTube just happens to be one of the ways of doing that, like within this massive ecosystem that I'm building. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I think that's what it is. But again, yes, COVID has led to um, to everyone just being online, right? And like, yeah. so. I guess some to some to some degree you are right. Like if I was to succeed with this project, um, I I can I can give some of that to COVID and say, all right, thanks uh, for for yeah, helping well, I mean, for giving me the time. <laughs> yeah, like I like for instance, like like people like in video calls and stuff. Or like that wasn't like a super big thing before COVID. It was like oh we meet in person and stuff, right? But like you're in the UK, I'm in Toronto. It's like whatever. Like being like on a video call. Like imagine like having a podcast. Like yeah, call, that's like not normal, right? It's it, not. It, yeah. Times. It's like mm. you invite them like to your office, like in the room, like you know Joe Rogan and style and whatever. Very true. Um, yeah. So yeah, I would say like, um, and that's made it easier essentially to connect with more smart people because they're all over the place, right? They're all around the globe. They're, yes. You can basically have your own like Silicon Valley, like San Francisco, from like your bedroom now because mm. you can connect, talk to people like within San Francisco, within everywhere in the world, right? Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Like, like I know this one guy from like Syria, and now he's in Turkey, um, like like Syria, right? That's that's like. What right? It's and wild, yeah. No, I get it's you. Wild, it's wild. He he's doing crazy stuff in, in like the crypto blockchain space. Um, like he is like killing it right now. Man, um, saying that you have to connect me to him because I have to talk to him because one of the yeah, I've, got, I've got I've got a list film. I've got a list of topics and um and blockchain is one of my again a big oh, big yeah. interest of mine and I, and I was just gonna mention to you as well like one of the biggest um things that is going to change or it's already changing right now as a result of this um access to resources decentralization is is the sort of the web3 movement right you've you've heard of web3 yeah, yep. yeah. Yep. so the whole web3 movement i think that's what's insane i think that's what's going to just supercharge the next stage of our evolution is that now it's no longer centralized right like everything now is decentralized and like you have all these pockets and nodes of um of of action going on where there is a a node that is like quite small in regards to the big system but that node is just like you said is is engineering peanuts right (laughs) and uh, but the effect of it it can be like um exponentially um, felt all around the entire system so i think that's the beauty of web3 that i'm so 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 um excited for um what 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 are your thoughts on blockchain anyways i yeah i love blockchain yeah yeah. (laughs) especially because there's this one company uh shout out to a molecule uh their website is molecule.to fantastic company so what they're doing is they're basically um decentralizing like research funding nice. so like a lot a lot, lot of a lot of times like labs and like small you know companies will have it will have a problem like getting research funding from like you know big institutions like the like the nih um and like stuff like government agencies and whatever right um so what they're doing is basically like each lab or like each like project or whatever right is like their own it's like it's like their own block on this like blockchain they have mm. and like it has like their own its own attributes so it has like the description of the project like what they've done and stuff um and you can basically like buy like tokens i don't know i don't even know how it works because it's 
blockchain is so confusing. Yeah, there is the, the tokenomics yeah. of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So you, you can like buy tokens or something from it and you can basically like contribute to that like project. And in return, you get like, you know, a cryptocurrency of that like actual like block. So like, for instance, I'll have like, you know, this amount of like coin of this project because I've contributed this much, right? And in the future, it's, it's like an investment, obviously, right? Yeah. So yeah. I can sell that later when, when they grow and stuff, right? So it's really, really good for like, it basically is decentralizing the entire um, research funding scene. Mm. It's, it's literally like that. Yeah, it's kind of like um like each, each, uh, each, uh, shit, like each, Sorry, each each uh, lab project is, is like its own NFT right now. So that's interesting. That's yeah, of, yeah, basically, yeah, really, basically, really interesting. that yeah. is actually really cool. So, but but then is it like is it accessible to the general public? The yeah, the papers, uh, pretty much. Yeah, uh, I, I, like like I think um, I'm not sure how the intellectual property thing works. There is something with that like IP and whatever. Um, but but um, there there is like. It, I think it is accessible. Like their their website is like up and stuff, so you can yeah. just go and browse the things. I don't know. I, I don't guess. Know oh, I see what you mean. I, yeah. I mean. I guess it's the actual like ownership of it, because that's what it comes down to with the uh, with stuff like ledgers. And again, I guess it. Uh, what I really like as well about the tokens that I use, the token systems within blockchain, is the mm -hmm. is the governance side of things. I think that is where it's just super, super uh, insane. Like you said, like where you can have ownership and then you can also have a stake in voting or like, you know, seeing where yeah. it goes. Um, for me, one of the biggest um, uh, innovations in blockchain that I really just, I just really, really just appreciate is um, DAOs, um, decentralized yeah. auto autonomous organizations. I just... I mean, I, for me, that is so in line with what I do because it's it just takes away all the unnecessary like fluff and bureaucracy. And it's like you just use smart contracts all the way through, <laughs> and you have an yeah. organization that is built around smart contracts. And like you don't need HR, you don't need a manager, you don't need this, you don't, you don't need all this nonsense. Like it's just like it's very very efficient. And yeah, I really, I really, really like that bit. I, I definitely connect me with your friend because I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to pick the shit out of his brain. <laughs> yeah, I will. I will actually, I will actually be with you right now. Yeah, yeah. Oh, but that's really cool. And um, uh, when you were having that conversation with your friend, actually, um, I think you guys dived into a bit of philosophy, and I said that you like that. I think that philosophy is your thing. Um, and I guess to some degree, you know, man is. Uh, to some degree, like man cannot avoid philosophy, right? Like the older you get, uh, the more alive you are. The, yeah. mo the, the more you live, the more you just, the more of a philosopher you become, I guess, because you just need to, you just, yeah. you, you start to look for meaning in the world around you. And I think that's pretty much what philosophy is to a degree. Um, so, um, of course, I see that you've got in some way a network of friends that you can discuss that with. So how do you, balance science then with your ethics and i'm speaking from a philosophical like way like um, perspective how do you because a lot of science can be very um can be very contradicting right um if we talk about for example one one quick example is um an iphone right it's like oh, oh the phones that you have is all like you know there's just cobalt in it that is like there's a this yeah dr congo this this so it's like well but you really need that phone though to continue this so it's like i'm not going to stop using the phone because of this but it doesn't mean that that's not valid as well so it's like how do you and th this this of course this can be exponential right like this can be in yeah. all the different facets of science like human exploitation like the environmental exploitation as well and destruction mm -hmm. so how exactly uh, do you find that you balance science with ethics i don't know i, I don't think i've like thought about it like again, like I guess, like the only thing with um, like if you mean like an example of like the thing we were talking about about like um, like CRISPR being like widely used by like, the public and how it can turn into like a street drug and also mm -hmm. that sort of stuff. Like I've thought about that sort of things. Um, yeah, in terms of like CRISPR and stuff. But like, is that is that what you kind of mean? Like yeah, like, yeah. Like in in whatever field it is. Like I, I, of course for you is, is CRISPR. Um, but I refer to yeah. science in general because I know you're also obviously you're into yeah. programming as well. You love the environment um yeah so there is yeah i mean you also make music as well it says on your on your yeah, profile yeah. so there's, there's all this there's all these things right and like like how how do you how do you then balance um science or the, or the use of technology 
uh, or have you ever, actually I'll probably make it I'll actually change the question I mean have you ever okay. found that science has 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 ever questioned your ethics question my okay like the only the only thing it 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 has done that in is so I'm I'm pretty religious so I'm I'm Muslim um so in I guess that's, like, that's that's a perfect uh, <laughs> segue yeah yeah yeah, mm. yeah. Um, so that's like, it does interfere with like, like sometimes science will talk about like how there is like no creator and everything came about like randomly, like this world is just like random, like big bang happened. And then somehow all these galaxies got made and then somehow, you know, like earth got made and then mm -hmm. somehow we had like life on it, and then somehow that life survived and then somehow it became like, this complex system and then somehow yes. it looked like both of the moon and stuff. So that is, uh, that is something that science talks about. Just like, oh, it all happened like randomly and stuff. I still have this thing that like, like, you know, the, the watch has to have a watchmaker. So like, if you, if like the, the example I give to like, basically like, you know, just think about it. So think about like, like, okay. So let's think of, so let's, let's say you're like you're in a desert, right? Let's say you're in a, in a desert. You have some like, you know, metal with you, whatever it is. Like, um, it could be like iron, maybe like some diamond, maybe some like, I don't know, like, like, like silicon or whatever. Right. And you just have a laying around in, in, in the sand. Right. And then out of nowhere, a lightning bolt comes down, just like randomly out of nowhere. It hits exactly like in the right spot. And then right in front of you, an iPhone is there, right? <laughs> so you have a perfectly running iPhone and you can run like, you know, five people down or whatever, right? Um, and it's just like, wait, like what are the chances of that ever happening, right? Mm. Like zero. Like that's very, very, very small, right? yeah. And if you think about the chance it takes to like have, you know, go from nothing to like the entire world we have right now, that likely that that's even less likely than that iphone coming into like existence from that lightning bolt and stuff right mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. like if you think about like the, how where this world came from it's it's literally impossible that it just came randomly of right? course of therefore course. there must be a, there must be a crater pretty much and there's also like other other things that i can have but it's a, it's a simple thought experiment that i always think about to like you know and stuff so science talks a lot about like how you know there, there basically science is is like it, it it doesn't consider like a god because science is the analysis of like god's creation and religion is like the analysis like of god itself right so you have these like two different like planes that yes, you're on and yes. you can't have science analyze god that's that's what spirituality is for yeah yeah that's no part. definitely i do you know i think you, yeah. you touched on it then that's a good point because when first of all if you look at science especially scientific um um origins they've been heavily persecuted by corrupt religious religions right like religious um, leaders whatever it is or institutions mm. so it makes sense that they've grown with some sort of um <laughs> it's been born out of some sort of hatred for religion so yeah. i'm not surprised that they've done everything they can to sort of debunk it and whenever you you see a scientist that starts to lean towards religion they they start to get um bad cred <laughs> right they start to get yeah. yeah and um and this is the thing as well is that you make a good point like spirituality can't be you, it's like you, you can't really merge that with science but maybe there is a link i find you guys i don't know if you've heard there of is the, a link. the godel incompleteness theory right so we already we already do know to some degree that the science that we have right now is incomplete and in my understanding i believe that spirituality com completes it right that is yeah, where i agree yeah I agree. that's I where agree. spirituality comes in to complete it but traditional science as we have it tries so hard to exclude spirituality um and i see now I, i'm starting to see a merger of it because people are trying are starting to grow like with um with more spiritual understanding uh and not just like religious fanatism like spiritual understanding a deep spiritual understanding that comes from the self right which is where philosophy mm -hmm. comes in because like, you think yeah. deep you meditate or you know you just read you read even more ancient texts and you understand how people were acting and how people were more you know living holistically for example and how that actually played a big part to the advancement of science so um yeah what what i found is that um science and i sorry spirituality definitely does complement science a lot definitely does complement science a lot um in regards to even yeah, the even even the even the, like you know, talking now about the the big bang and stuff i don't know man i think the story i think that that story is gonna get debunked at some point <laughs> within the next i don't know yeah no, no, no within the next century i guess uh, it will get debunked i mean because <laughs> because 
I don't know. I, I think it's one of those things like it's a band aid to like this big thing that we don't know. So we just yeah. put like a massive band aid over it. But then for me, whenever I think about life, especially in terms of the driving force, uh, I know what you mean by there being a creator. I don't really think of it much as a creator per se. I think of it more as a driving force. Um, mm-hmm. uh, so my, the, the, the way, the analogy I give is sort of, all right, if you look at yourself as a human being, you're made up of um, cells, right? And then there's this massive like protein that makes up your skin. And then when you zoom into it, it's just carbon, right? Carbon molecules that are charged and held together in a specific way that creates your skin. And then if you look into that carbon at, um, and molecules, you've got the electrons, you've got the proton, the neutron, you look into the, the nucleus, you've got the neutrino, you've got the muon electron mm-hmm. neutrinos, you've got, if you look down to, you've got quarks, you got, I mean, so this, there's this deep level to it. And then you look further and further and then you realize that's what, like over half of this atom is basically made up of dark matter, right? It's empty. Right, there's all this mm-hmm. stuff that we don't even know about it, and then every single thing in the conceive- conceivable universe, right? Be it a black hole, a star, a pulsar, uh, a, a comet, an asteroid, whatever it is, a planet, a star, like a, a white dwarf, even even just space itself, right, is flowing with these atoms. So I'm like, all right. So what it seems like behind these atoms, there is inside them a, some sort of message, because the, the only way, because the only way for them to know what they're doing and be able to do what they're doing is if there is information within them. It's almost like DNA. How you don't need to tell DNA what to do, and it does it because there's information inside it. You don't need to tell you know two hydrogen molecules to uh, and oxygen to turn to water. The, there is information within them that allow them to do that when they connect, right? So it's that, so my I think this is a theory I don't know I, I, I just like discuss it's like I don't know like in in terms of understanding how spirituality plays a part it's like or right, well I might not know who the creator is well I I I I was brought up Christian by the way so obviously we have the same theories of like you know God God building um you know creating the world um. I've read a lot of Chinese mythologies with the, with the, with the okay. egg as well. Um, you oh, read, uh, yes. Yeah, you read a lot as well, even in Hindu as well, about like Krishna and like or just the different like mm-hmm. facets to what God is and how creation is. Even where I'm from in Igbo mythology as well, there is different like, you know, <laughs> stories of how the world, world, world was created. So I understand that, all right, human beings tell stories to pass on information. So I can filter all these stories and realize that oh shit it's coming from one place is that there seems to be something that is driving everything i guess maybe people describe it as god or whatever it is but i see it as there's a driving force and that driving force lives in a subatomic level right where these atoms carry this information and they're doing like these atoms can combine together and build a freaking black hole like <laughs> i think that's pretty insane and that's i think that's why I would, I, i'm quite interested in quantums um quantum science mm-hmm. uh, understanding i, I, I want to follow and i hope you know even if i don't i can upload my brain into into the cloud at some point <laughs> and i'll be able to eventually see and uh, understand what an atom is um comprises of because i feel that the information that we need to know about our creation comes from what an atom is and what's inside it because if you can fully understand it i think we'll be able to finally understand what they're trying to do because think about it right all there is is just a bunch of atoms make make up you right and then this bunch of atoms have a consciousness it doesn't make any sense like they have just the bunch of atoms like they just you can't even see them right yeah. And then all of a sudden, so it's like, it's like they're trying to do something. It's like they're all coming together. It's like, all right, you, you make a planet, right? And then this planet has life. And then this, this life evolves from the, from the sea and then goes to the trees and then it comes down from the trees. And now it's building itself back into space. And then all of a sudden, we're all uploading our, ourselves on the internet, creating some sort yep. of hive of data that then will be able to do its own thing. It's like, yep. I don't know. I, I think I think it's quite fascinating, man. Like, I think the atom is 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 something that's yeah. interesting. Don't don't sleep on, but yeah, don't sleep on the atom, man. <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> I just think of it like, yeah. does the atom have its own agenda, or is there like something controlling the atom itself? Exactly, like, exactly. That's yeah. where I've. That's where I've. Uh, my 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 thought uh, my thought um um activity has led me to. It's like, all right, it's either the atom itself has that information inside it, or it's it's being controlled. But then again, I know we we don't really know much about dark matter, do we? No. And so, I mean, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, and then that that makes up again something like sixty to seventy yeah. percent of the universe. So, yeah. yeah, obviously, there's so much for us to uh, to figure out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I think I, I just go with whatever like intuitively like makes more sense, like like the logically right. Like that's even like Islam itself. It, it's it's like based on like like just like logic and like yes yes i really like i like i really like the islamic philosophy man um compared yeah. to <laughs> most other yeah because a friend lent me the um actually he didn't lend it he he he, he uh, advised that i buy the quran and read it and it's so yeah. i love the philosophy it's so well written like you know what i mean like exactly, yeah. I, I think the bible for me is the best is the best best like tv show ever written right it's as much as, as much as, like, no, I, I don't mean that as an insult. I actually, I, you know, the way people respect Quentin Tarantino and that. I think yeah. the Bible is a beautifully written, like, fiction book that is just the stories are yeah. wild, right? And it's like, yeah. you, I don't know what you're on to come up with that, but it's so well yeah. done <laughs> that it's literally. But then the the antithesis of that is then the Quran in terms of how it's written. It's written a lot more like like I said, there's a lot of maths, there's a lot of philosophy. Yeah. I like that as well. So I definitely agree with you in that sense. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's a lot on there's a lot on that topic I have to share for sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I guess I if if we started talking on that right now, we would not finish, would we? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That that'll, that'll take a while. That'll take a while. Yeah. Defo, yeah. defo. Well, how do you keep yourself sane amongst all this chaos then? <laughs> how do i keep myself sane amongst all this like philosophy chaos well the chaos, chaos of the world i guess i mean philosophy there yeah. is this covid there's all this i know um i know you play basketball you do music so what yeah. what are these what are these um ah. mechanisms that you use to keep yourself sane okay 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 i see um yeah i mean like i guess Again, I it also goes back to Islam. <laughs> <laughs> please, I guess please a, e educate yeah, me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of what I uh, like, Islam, like, like the, the Quran itself describes, like, the Quran is like a manual for like living life, pretty much. So like, mm -hmm. it tells you how to like live the optimal, like, perfect life. Like, if you want to live like you know a happy life, of course, there's gonna be you know some sad moments, obviously, but mm -hmm. if you want to live, you know, with like decency, so it tells you. A lot of these things right and like it tells you the the main reason you were created like the main purpose is not to like you know solve cancer or whatever like you know do all these things you know learn coding whatever that's not the main purpose of you the main purpose not, not even advanced civilization the main purpose uh, and okay so exactly yeah but the main purpose was you to to worship god mm -hmm. right so that's the main purpose but then you're like, wait, what? Like, we're just supposed to be like sitting all day, like, you know, like, yeah, uh, whatever, right? right? Praying. So <laughs> the thing is, the thing is that worshiping God is more than just like, you know, praying, you know, whatever, like five, we, we, we pray five times a day and stuff, but it's more than just that. Like worshiping God um, is also like, you know, contributing to society, like in a positive manner. Like, that, that's, that's, that is an act of worship. An act of worship is also, um, you know, like just smiling at someone. That's an act of worship. So uh, being... Or watching like your anger, right? That's an act of worship. Uh, like you know, uh, so basically the things that you would you would think of that are already like good things in life and stuff are also a wor acts of worship, pretty much. Mm, so an act of mm. every 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 single every single thing that is an act of worship is beneficial for you. So like we even like you know fasting is a really really big thing that we do, uh, and of course it it we do it mainly for the thing to worship God, but obviously it has some physical it benefits. It has its benefits, too, right? yeah. And even like praying five times a day. Um, you know, we're it the way the way we pray. It, we like get up. You know, we kind of like do. It's it's kind of it looks a lot like yoga, if that makes sense. <laughs> um, I wouldn't really call it yoga, but yeah, we like get up. We like you know stretch around a little bit. And if you do that at five times a day for your life, every single day for your life, imagine how like fit at least you're gonna be when you're like seventy years. I think right? also even mentally, it's a sense of um, consistency and routine that it allows yep. you because many people find it very difficult to be consistent. Exactly. So. It has exactly. a it has a it has a mental condition as well that it gives you strength exactly. and resilience. Yeah, 
exactly so it has a bunch of these other effects that comes with it right even if we have so one prayer we have uh it's called fajr and fajr is basically really really early in the morning so right now it, where i'm living at least it's around like 4 30 in the morning so you would actually get up at 4 30 in the morning like out of bed and stuff you you know um you know and then you would pray and then if you want to go back to sleep you go back to sleep or you can just stay up at that point so mm -hmm. even waking up early is you know part of our religion and of course waking up early we know that there's a lot of a lot of benefits waking up early like, like it's bad if you like wake up like Lee. that's that's something that you shouldn't be doing waking yeah. up early is also an act of worship yeah um going to sleep on time is an act of worship so i see it's interesting things, how you interpret yeah. it yeah 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 exactly like of course the the primary thing for us is that we're worshiping god but obviously in the background there's all these wonderful things happening right so it's kind of like we just put our trust in you know god in, in allah right um we put our trust in him and and at the same time like in the background we, we don't have to worry about all these things that are happening because at the same time the things that we are doing to worship him are actually in fact helping us like in the end right so everything we do is to is to help ourselves pretty much mm -hmm. uh so i don't like i don't like consciously think about oh i gotta wake up early because it's you know circadian rhythm all i think of like i just, I just gotta like you know worship my god yeah um yeah that's it so no we, that's we, interesting any, yeah yeah so that, that's kind of how i keep saying i just like go back to my religion I like you know read Quran and reading Quran is like so comforting. It's crazy. Like the the words in the Quran are are like the we believe they're the words of God and they're they're the words of God. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And like they have not just like awesome meaning, but even just like hearing them. Even if you don't understand Arabic, like I don't understand Arabic. I just know how to recite Arabic. But like even just hearing it, it's it's like soothing like to the ear. Like it's it's perfect. It's perfect. Like um like speech. Um so yeah like stuff like that I do. Uh, it just comforts me. Like it's yeah. So. I, a lot of a lot of the religion feeds the soul because right right now in the world uh, are like a lot of the things we do right like, like all of our five senses right our eye our mouth our mouth our nose our hands whatever you mm -hmm. know our hearing it's all outward facing right mm -hmm, there's not mm -hmm. one sense that is like looking inside the body there was one thing that uh i don't know if you know Sadhguru. Sadhguru. He's like yes this, uh, yes indian yeah. dude yeah indian guy yeah indian guy so uh he he said like if you hadn't brushed your teeth in let's say like a week right even though your nose is right here above your mouth, right here, if you were in, like, if you stepped into, into a room, right, everybody in the room would know that you haven't brushed your teeth, but you still wouldn't know. Yeah, so except for you. Yeah. We judge others a lot by like the outside, even though there's a lot that's happening inside that we have no clue about, right? Mm, and mm. Islam is basically like all the worship that we do, it, it also feeds that soul inside of us because, again, we believe that our primary purpose we're even here we're, we, we're alive is to worship god and that might sound greedy of course at first glance but if you think about it really like what we're actually doing it's also helping us a lot like in the end um that's what that's the primary thing like we don't worship god to make you know god feel great or whatever right like he's not he's not, he's not even human he doesn't even have those attributes to him we worship god because we want to actually help ourselves so no no yeah. definitely i understand that because um even for me um growing up as a christian Mm -hmm. I've always been like super inquisitive and then the whole idea of religion in itself um, just didn't make any sense because it always seemed to be um, to be like a template right yeah. it's almost like oh this is what you need to do for this and for me just being young it just never made any any real sense to me it's like I, I just never saw it to be like all right all the, first of all there's there, there are many plot holes around but, then, but again, humans are very diverse. And it's like, I don't think that every single person can like fit into a template of what to do. And again, the whole idea of God as well, for me was like, well, I think that's what's actually quite key. It's like, how do you actually interpret God? Because you just described it as sort of um, a way of life in a sense, right? So it's like, it, you, you, it, at least it, it helps you to attain a way of life that keeps you safe yeah. <laughs> keeps I, you I safe say, I, I, I would say i would say i describe like religion as that i, I would mm. say i describe like that, that i would say that like, i describe religion, Re that, religion as that like, yeah but i was like this like one you know like you know figure like that actually like has made everything that's why that's why I describe yes God. yes but, uh, yeah yeah but my religion yeah that's we're describing religion but yeah. that, that's the that's the thing yeah and thanks for the for um clarifying so that's the thing again it's like the idea of this one big thing even that in itself did not make any sense to me again that was just me being mm -hmm. super inquisitive and i felt i think that that took me on a journey where i like i said i read the bible i read the quran i read a lot of mythology from so many different areas and the more i dug into older religions right because 
stuff like I don't know, like um, Judaism, um, Judaism, um, mm-hmm. um, Christianity, Islam. They're, they're relatively new um, compared to stuff like like Hinduism yep. and, and Buddhism, right? Yep. And um, I started diving into all the all the religions, and I started noticing that the message itself is is similar right it's very very similar very similar and they all it's almost like it's been sort of it's like you know how we have um, Blade Runner B- B- Blade Runner and there's like a remake of it and then in, in 300 years time they're going to make another remake of Blade Runner you know what I mean like and they just keep on yeah. diluting the story further and further but then if you look there was just like eternal thread that sort of ties them all together right sort of thing and I feel that's sort of what religions are like every religion is sort of tied by its eternal thread so my my uh, my mission was to just keep on pursuing it all the way to like the almost the beginnings of it and um, again I'm, I, I wouldn't say that I'm religious I would say maybe I'm, I'm more spiritual because of um, just understanding what that means to me but mm-hmm. one thing that I've learned a lot from uh, from just like Hindu philosophy is that idea of God that you spoke about. Because if you look at stuff like Christianity or Islam, they refer to God as they've, they, they've sort of, they've given God these like almost physical properties of like being either male or being an entity in its own right. But... Yeah, um, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was saying Christianity does that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but then you look at like Hindu philosophy and the idea of God even though they use words um, to describe it as a person, the idea of God is not necessarily this thing that's outside. God is actually your mm-hmm. higher self, right? It's like the maximum potential that you can be, the absolute purest, absolute best like version of yourself is what the idea of God is. So that, that purest version of you, of that individual is God. And... In that purest form, philosophically, it obviously doesn't have the ego, doesn't have a face, doesn't have a character, doesn't have a being. And obviously, that is what is exactly the same as every single human. That's why every single human essentially is the same. It's because that source is literally just exactly the same thing. And obviously, that source in itself is divine and all that stuff. And that was actually quite interesting, um, understanding that, because then that gave me more context to looking at other religions and seeing as to how it's able to manifest into some sort of entity that exists externally. Well, that was always a conflict for me. It's like, I think it made more sense looking at God as something that was internal inside me, as opposed to being something external, because being something external almost seems like I'm outsourcing it, right? It's like, <laughs> but then, of course, it, it does help in, to some degree, because it has helped us to some degree. It's like, it's kept us yeah. accountable, right? Because we can't keep ourselves accountable. So we're like, well, there's this guy that's looking at me or this entity looking at me uh, that's told me this. So it makes more sense that I'm more likely to, you know, be kept accountable if it's outside me. But um, yeah, that, that, that was, um, was, was a fine year I came uh, across that gave me a lot more context into what, uh, what God meant. And I guess, again, you know, gives me that level of, allows me to, I guess, it allows me to be a lot more accountable to myself. Because I realize that actually I am the one who is in charge. I'm the one who's the coach. I'm the one who is the ultimate decider of where my life goes, right? Um, there are a lot of things that I cannot predict because other people too are the ultimate deciders of their life. So when you combine that <laughs> into the system, the algorithm is just <laughs> is very likely yeah. going to create random patterns, right? And then those random yeah. patterns can affect the entities within it. So... Um, yeah, that, that was something that I, that I came across. And again, of course, I don't think my, my search for this has ended. I'm, I'm 26 and I, yeah. I'm, I've just learned this in the past like two years or so. So, uh, but definitely though, I think coming back to it, which is that, that, that eternal um, thread that, that connects everything together, is that there is something that is beyond your ego. There's something beyond your conscious um, plane of sight. Mm-hmm. And I think um, a closer understanding or a closer um, or, t- or taking actions to take that, that bring you closer to that as, uh, eventually, I guess, is, is allows you to allows you to attain. No, sorry, allows you to be a better version of yourself and allows you to actually um, act more just and act more kindly outwards to other people. 
I believe. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, like the thing you talked about, like, the thread. Uh, that's something I like believe in too. I think like, like even like uh, like in, in Islam, like um, you know, believe like they're they're messengers and stuff, right? So we believe that like pretty much every nation had a messenger for like you know of God. So you know, back all the way from like the first like, civilization to ever exist to like you know the last. Messenger, which we believe last messenger was was God. Or it's not, not God, sorry, Muhammad, mm. sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So we believe that that was he was the last messenger, and like now, like the the people after him, like us right now, are like his ummah, so like his people, basically mm-hmm, like his nation. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so it makes sense, like fundamentally, like like if the if the message was the same, right? And we believe that there were messengers, like you know, in India, wherever Hinduism came from, uh, you know, even like you know, I don't know, all over the world, right? Um, in China, even. The message was still the same. The message was still, you know, that there's one God and all these things. Right? That's what I believe in. Um, and obviously, as time went on, like religions, you know, we believe that a lot of the religions, like, you know, got corrupt over time. Like, you know, people, um, you know, took like, for instance, like lines out of uh, like a like a like a religious book. And yeah, like, like, yeah. And stuff, right. So all that stuff happens, of, and it's inevitably going to happen, right? Um, and obviously that's that happened and that's why people like even like people who are atheists and people that you know dismiss religions and who are all into science say that like obviously like you know like like um like if you take like a math book right a thousand years ago or you take like a religion book they will say like, like the math book will remain the same throughout all the years till like now because math doesn't change but the religion book will be will change right because we yeah. want to obviously take things out maybe intentionally unintentionally whatever right but there will be things that you know will get fabricated will be corrupt and stuff and that's why religions now are completely different from how they were like back then yeah um yeah but of course like i say this and then i'll feel it's like kind of dismissing my own religion but it's <laughs> not because um like islam is is a bit different in the sense that like the way it was right now is kind of exactly how it was like back then and that's something that islam is specifically like like for like that's that's the reason why um like that's how islam is like even the quran right the way it's written um this uh, this is what i've heard is that like even if you take like one line just out of the quran right like or just like exchange it with a different line the sentence itself does not make any sense mm. like you, you can't like just you can't just like change something yeah that's that's like, this is where the maths comes in and i know a friend was telling me as well i haven't verified yeah. this but it's like there's a balance between the amount of time man and woman is mentioned as well in in the quran Yes, um, yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of, yeah. like I said, there's a lot of geometry and maths. This is why I really, really like the book. And um, like I said, uh, in terms of the philosophy and the maths behind it. So I see what you mean because um, structures that are like more, um, I guess, like math, structures that are much more um, uh, designed, you know what I mean? Like, like yeah. has, has a sense of a architecture structure. and design. Yes, a structure to it. It's much harder to take it off because if I just take out the foundational beam of my house because I don't like it, right? Yeah. That that's detrimental to me. The whole house is just gonna fall off. And yeah. it seems like Islam is that. I know. I, I definitely I agree with you. Um, it seems like one of those religions that are much more like, uh, I guess at least the, the the context of it seems to have stood the test of time and and stayed quite um quite quite pure to its roots. But then yeah. again, within within every um within every just you know, within within every like uh, environment you find yourself, there is still like changes and there's still obviously. adaptations of it. Yeah, yeah, obviously, yeah. and yeah. that's that's what's like that's there's even like so there there's different things we follow, right? So there's three different things. There's one one of them is the Quran, obviously. The second one is like um a hadith. So, the like, hadith, the, so the, the stories, yeah. yeah. Yeah, like so, so what the prophet did, like his life and stuff, and the, uh, along with hadith, we have like sirah, so, like yes. the prophet's like life, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so. Quran is like the most pure sort of like source of information, right? If it's mentioned in the Quran, it's like 100% like no debate, right? Because the Quran itself, you can't you can't change the Quran. Um, hadith is obviously a bit less, you know, um, accountable than that because it's just you know people have been writing it down and like whatever, and sometimes they can get they can get changed and stuff, right? But there's an, it's, there's like an entire science that goes into like verifying hadith with which hadith are correct, yeah, which hadith yeah. are like you know stronger than others. But because not that many so of them, are they? They're, Sorry? they're not that many hadiths uh i would i mean like there's about like a few thousand i would say i think so oh really like, that much yeah, yeah. i thought i thought yeah, the hadiths were like not more than like I, again maybe it's yeah, like yeah, in terms yeah, of yeah, time yeah. though yeah it's it's a time because there's like earlier ones they're later ones aren't they 
No, there's there's all like the only hadith that were there were from like the time the from the, of the Prophet like Salah so, like, was was alive pretty much. So like So you've got was, you've got all these like yeah. thousands of people. Again, sorry, I, I just want to I need to validate the things that yeah. I've, I've learned. So yeah. I thought that the hadith were li- were written by sort of nobles in a sense though, like people who were or maybe intellectuals of the time in some like yeah, pe- you know, people people that yeah. were like around the prophet pretty much the sahaba that's yeah what yeah so so yeah. I, did, I didn't realize there were thousands of them i thought they were literally like uh, maybe, I mean, I mean, maybe I a hundred or something, say, or something. Uh, yeah yeah like like a, a hundred but like mm. they've written multiple right so like it, it multiplies obviously so like see. there's thousands of that I so, see. so um yeah so it's different like narrations of like you know how he would you know do certain things like mm. what he would mm. say to so some people like stories of like like if something isn't addressed in the Quran, then you would look into like hadith. The hadith, right? if yeah. Want, if you want something that's, if you want like some like clarification on a verse, for instance, from the Quran, right? It doesn't really make much sense. Then you would look into the life of the Prophet, like the hadith itself, like the sirah as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but obviously, there's some people that you know, there's there's tons of fabricated hadith, right? There's tons of well, fabricated hadith, exactly. Obviously, <laughs> and there's, there, that's why there's an like, entire science that goes into like finding like these fabricated hadith. Like that's why that's why. Islamic universities, like you can get a degree yeah, as yeah. an Islamic scholar, right? That's, that's that's their whole job is to find these fabricated hadiths, validate them, and they look at like different sources, right? They will look at like one source that mentions like you know this story or whatever. They look at another completely different source that mentions the exact same story mm. and like a bunch of different sources, and they will like cross reference. And if 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 all the match up, then this hadith is probably like pretty strong, right? Whereas mm. a hadith that's only in one place, random, you know, kind of area, it's probably like it's likely that's very fabricated. Interesting. So, yeah, that's that's where it's like a whole science. I don't even know how the science completely works because I'm not a scholar of Islam. Yeah, uh, but it's a whole it's a whole thing, and that's that's kind of um that's kind of why I have such a strong faith in this religion because obviously like things will go wrong as uh, like as time goes on, people will want to you know make these changes and stuff. But there's just too much that is like in like in the Quran, even like predictions that the Prophet had that will that have actually like come now and mm. stuff. Like for instance, like signs of like the day of judgment, like the last day, you know, whatever. Um, there's one, one of the signs is that, um, shoot, uh, like there's, yeah, sorry. One, one, one of the signs was, uh, wait, ah, crap. I, why am I figuring them right now? Okay. So there's one sign that's like about like water and like how like three years before, uh, something happens, uh, like the first year there will be like two thirds of the, or like one third of the water, like that'll rain down will be held up in the heavens or something. Mm-hmm. And, I saw this one like documentary that I was talking about by like 2025, two thirds of the world's water will, um, there, we will, we will only have two thirds of like the amount of water we have now. Like, I don't know. This is kind of random, but like, no, no, yeah, I, no, like- I, I get you. Bro, but again, this comes back to the whole thing you spoke about the hadiths, right? And how yeah. you can get, so basically it's like you take information, you look into the Quran and then you said you can like verify it as well, the hadith. So it's almost like, um, it does allow, a level of think of it as like scaling right it's like it's like mm-hmm. when you scale uh, uh, an infrastructure so it's like yeah. the hadiths allow you to scale so it's like you can almost verify every, anything so think of it as um the, the 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 quran itself is like python and then um the hadiths in combination with it is like the django library right so it's like yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can then exactly. add <laughs> you yeah. can then add to it you can add to the library and but then some things you add to the library can also make the library break so like people can then take it off um within the can, can take out the commit from it so yeah uh, it's yeah. almost it's almost similar to that so it's like i can then validate you can validate findings and i guess that's that's one of the reasons why for me maybe again maybe i've just been too indoctrinated into the scientific process not that i don't see anything else i mean more in terms of the scientific method right where i'm like all right if an idea comes i try to validate so like even like seeing stuff like the like you just said the documentary about the two-third thing of course like we have that conscious bias where because you you've had that consistency which is great right of reading the quran and praying yeah, then yeah, yeah. you're more likely going to then connect those two obviously, things together so there is a, there's yeah. a conscious bias to it but then again of course i'm not saying i obviously i can't confirm or deny that that's not true i look forward to the year 2025 right <laughs> yeah. okay, i mean that, that, that was from a week one i actually have one more it's so like one one of them but i think that's that, interesting yeah yeah, yeah. So, there's, there's one where it's like um there will be actually an interesting one there that there's going to be like 70 i think three sects it's like uh like different like you know uh sections of islam um like by like the end of time pretty much so if you look at it like right now we have around I think like 70 something like sex almost mm. pretty much almost that number and this was predicted by you know like the hadiths like 
a long time ago, like thousands of years mm. ago, when there was mm. only like one Islam, right? So it's kind of funny that even like he, like like said, like of course that's not him; it's like God telling him. Yeah. But, like um, uh, like he like he, it's predicted that like Islam would break up into like seventy sects. If you told someone like back then, like Islam would be like you know seventy different sects, they're like, wait, what? Like how? Like Islam yeah. is like. But then after after right? after, after Muhammad died, I mean he. Islam basically broke into two sects, anyways, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. And it's kind of interesting. So, that, like, he printed that already, like, in, yeah, it's and it started stuff. happening there. Yeah, I think yeah. it's quite, that, that. That's actually pretty interesting, man. I think that's quite cool because then if you look yeah. at the the stories there as well within the the Quran, I think it's like looking back, even like it's very like historical as well, right? And how yeah. you can look at all the history of what's happened in the past. Now, I really like I really like learning about all that stuff, man. Um, <laughs> now, I do, I do, I genuinely do. Um, I think actually I learned a lot about um, Islam in um, during lockdown, during the first lockdown. I was I was like I went on Khan Academy, and mm, I was just like yeah. watching a ton of like I was explaining a lot of things. And then obviously I was like, speaking Khan Academy. <laughs> yeah, man, it's it's really weird. Like they had lots of like because they have this course about the just just history of time, right, right from the beginning, just going through everything so i was just sitting there just watching the whole thing right from the beginning just watching everything but again it's like we spoke before that's like the 20 percent, more like five percent the surface knowledge right and then anything i mentioned there i then it's like i then take it on and then i sort of either research it or ask friends as well i've got my, my friend as well he's actually from syria who um explained who explained it to me and then just explaining more like i said told me about the hadiths and then give me yeah, more yeah, concept yeah, yeah. give me more context to it all and i was like Wow, it's a fascinating story. Tell me more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, now, it's interesting how humans tell stories. Um, I think storytelling has been one of the, I still is one of the biggest ways to connect to human emotion, and we still exploit it right now. We be it in marketing or whatever it is, yeah. like we still exploit it. And that's the thing, like within this text, right? On be it, all right. I'll use, I'll use. Um, Hinduism, because at the moment now, where I've got to in terms of the oldest religion is Hinduism. And, and I know that they're more older than that, yeah, yeah, which yeah. I haven't got to yet. But in Hinduism, for example, what I've learned is that, because a lot of people look at Hinduism as like, oh, they've got so many different gods. But I'm like, mm. actually, within Hinduism, the, the, those different, the, there's not so many different gods. There is there's one god, right? And that's why yeah. I explained to you, is the one that's sort of that pure divinity. But then... It expresses itself in different ways, which mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense because uh, humans are like multifaceted, right? Like there's a multiplicity to every human. Like today you feel creative, tomorrow you feel agile and strong. You 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 run. You get what I mean. Tomorrow you feel sad. Next day you feel angry. Next you feel like you want to cook. You feel you know. Just, you feel love. You feel passion. So. And that is literally how, because again, it's about storytelling, right? And and is the way they told the stories at the time. It's like when they see someone, especially again, I'll refer back to my own place in Igbo, in Igbo land and Igbo culture. Uh, when you see someone act in a specific way, you basically that that that, that character uh, becomes an entity of its own. It's like you give off an energy, and that energy becomes its own entity. So you can so someone can say to you that you're giving off the energy of a specific god right and but that god basically is, is in reference to that character like this you're really really strong they'll say like you've been they say you've been um uh what's the word when 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 some like a spirit takes over you um, uh like like a, a spirit. <laughs> yeah possessed uh, yeah possessed yeah possessed, yeah, yeah. Possessed. so it's like you've been possessed by that god but what they're referring to is more like you're basically channeling a specific type of energy right so that's actually something again that gave me so much more clarity as to how religions were formed and how people were making sense of the world because of course we didn't we didn't have the science and the knowledge that we have around about the whole world right now like we do so they were probably just looking at us like all right let's use storytelling and very descriptive storytelling right <laughs> to <Yeah. laughs> to express emotion to express um human activity and a lot of this got portrayed in the in the gods and the way that it is and even if you come all the way back down now to um religions now or you talk about islam or even christianity for example mm. uh, and you look at the stories and that is where for example my caveat is is that we then take this story so literally in some cases and that's like understanding the anthropology of it, the history of it, where it's come from. A lot of these literal words were more descriptive, right? They, they, were, they, were, they were describing a context. 
as opposed to it being this specific thing, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. But then now we read it and we take it for that specific thing, which I think, yeah. again, which is, where, which is probably where a lot of the conflicts and misunderstandings um, arise from. Yeah, like I, I, in Islam too, like the stories, like you, you can take them like literally and they also there's there's both a literal meaning and a, and a metaphorical meaning. And it's really mm. interesting that like both the meanings can complement each other and they both also make sense on their own. They're not like conflicting each other. Um, but like, yeah, like like you can have, that's what I said, that's kind of also the beauty of the Quran as well. Because there's like both literal meanings, metaphoric, metaphorical meanings, meanings that like, correlate with like other verses about like different like stories and like how they have like the same message and stuff mm-hmm. um so there's all that yeah yeah pretty much but like, i yeah i, I but I, I wouldn't say that like um religions were like created by people like that's that's what like obviously like makes sense how like, we people created religions to like you know have like like faith and like you know like have like this I mean, yeah to, values, to explain right? the world around them to a to a degree yeah yeah the way the i my my view is that like religion like came down from us and i, I like it's also kind of like the no no please please go egg, on right? please go on also like it's also like what came first, the chicken or the egg? Like, is it because mm, mm. i i was brought up in religion that i think like that or is it because like that it actually is the way and like now after corruption we think that like you know all it was actually like humans that made these religions so it's kind of i don't know if that made sense yeah no 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 no, no. i I want you to go back to that i'm gonna i'm gonna hold you by the hand for that so when you say it's come down to us can you just give me a little bit more context come down in what sense like so like you mean metaphysically or um or you mean literally like come down or okay so like 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 the quran right that's an example of like, like 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 it coming down so like the quran is like a revelation specifically like from god so, like that's literally like god speaking to us pretty much like like the quran because that's what we believe that um like god you know gave the angel like jibrail alayhi salam so G- gabriel gabriel in English, yeah. and uh gabriel talked to muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam, peace be upon him mm-hmm. um and then he, when so gabriel basically gave the message to muhammad and then muhammad recited it out and people you know you know learned the recitations and then some at some point people like wrote it down actually and and you know and at that time um, made it like into a book, you know, which now is the Quran. Mm-hmm. So the Quran is literally like the 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 like it came down like pretty much like if you think about like it, a little book didn't fall out of the sky. I get you. Was, I like, guess the message was, itself. Like, the message itself, right? The message itself. Very like, similar message. to to Moses uh, on top of Mount Sinai, yeah. right? Where exactly God it, it, basically it gave him thing. the the same commandments, thing. right? And he wrote it down. But same thing. I mean, yeah. But isn't it fair to say though that? Again, maybe this is just uh, more of like yeah, just yeah, just right. my thoughts, but isn't it unfair to say that? Because a lot of these people, there's something that happens here yeah, to humans when you're in solitude. When you're in solitude, you, uh, especially when you're in mindful solitude and you sort of go into it as a sort of project to work on something. Like if you think of every single like religious figure, right? In terms of like like you know like religious figures that have made a massive impact, be it buddha um mm-hmm. be it jesus if moses um uh, muhammad mm-hmm. they've all gone away like there was something about solitude like solitude that played a big big part in this and of course me being someone as well who has been researching to this i think I've, I've experimented in myself i've tried to like experiment like a month in solitude when i'm working in a project and i'm giving like my focus on it and i found that i am forced to comprehend my physical abilities i'm com- I'm, I'm forced to comprehend my mortality um i'm forced to comprehend my mental state i'm forced to comprehend my spiritual like my existence you know there's all this it's not just like you're in solitude and you're sitting there like working on a project like it then starts scaling up you realize oh shit you start to see this bigger picture mm-hmm. to who you are and although obviously that a big part of that is your experiences because experiences make who you are right and I would like to think I'm quite lucky to have been surrounded with people who love care and have, you know, impacted a lot of knowledge to me. So that combination of things, right, allow me to be able to then combine it and then create something out of it. And for me, I see that as, as, as a manifestation of God, right? Like that God in me has then been able to create this thing. And I think it's very similar if you look at it with the stories of every single, like, major religious leader who have basically gone away. Like Muhammad went to the mountain, right? 
Um, Jesus went away to the desert for 40 days. Um, you know, same with Moses as well, went away and came back with it. You know, Buddha as well went into the forest as well. I mean, and then they came out with this realization. So I think the solitude plays a big part. And of course, this is just me um, speaking purely from the research perspective, right? From the, from, the, from the scientific research perspective in terms of, not even scientific per se, I'd say more human human logic like yeah logic. yeah like yeah just human behavioral like and logic like so it's like all right just trying to put yourself in the shoes of these people at that time they've actually gone away and given the type of influence and knowledge and personalities they were because mohammed was well educated was super educated right um, no he wasn't <laughs> like he was he, he had he had um he had he, he was not like he was not poor like he was poor <laughs> was he right from the beginning yeah, he he was, he, he was very poor. He because was very he, he, he came out yeah. to... Sorry, because from, I'm, just, yeah. I'm just trying to... If I want to say what I know, so then you can then debunk it yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or, or clarify it. Yeah, because yeah. he eventually had a lot of... Oh, yeah, true. He, he, he hustled. He hustled, right? And was able to get some sort of um, favor with a lot of people. Because was it Fatima, his wife? Yeah, yeah Fatima. She was, wife, yeah. Not, she, was, she was not poor, was she? And she was slightly older than him as well. So, because I know he was connected, he was just, I think of his character, he was able to connect with people. So, when I mean poor, I don't mean points yeah. of wealth, like he was rich in terms of his network, in terms of his, oh, yeah. his, his network was, yeah, his, his connection. So, I, I, again, sorry if I didn't clarify that. So, he was, like, he had access to this, to education in that sense of people who he was meeting, to knowledge, again, I mean, to, to a network of people. And I think that plays a big part in, in someone's life because, like I said, your experiences make you who you are. And uh, I, I guess the same with someone like Buddha, for example. Buddha was not like poor either. Like he, he was educated and he had access to knowledge. And I feel like that as a base is a really good starting place. And then when you go into solitude, you're able to then reflect upon that. Mm -hmm. And that gives you a lot of context about yourself. And then when you start to dive deep into yourself and you find that divinity within yourself, that divinity within yourself is very likely the same exact divinity within other people as well. So it's very easy, I think, to relate to humans at that point and then tell stories that everyone can then be like, oh yes, of course, this is something that I can relate to. I don't know if that makes, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I think, I think that like, it's like, but you need like, so with Muhammad right? like, like the way, the way he was, is that, before he got the revelation, like he was like you know well known in like in the in his village like in, mm -hmm. in Mecca, right? Uh, he was he was well known because he was you know a nice, very very nice person, obviously. Yeah. Um, everyone like you know at least knew him and stuff. Uh, but he still like was relatively like he he was literally like a shepherd, like yeah, yeah, said, yeah. sheep, and it was yeah. him. Um, uh, but like and then and the and the craziest part is that he 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 didn't know how to like read or write. It's really interesting. Mm. He didn't know how to read or write. Um, which is also like another reason why it's even more crazy that like he was reciting all these things. That yeah, yeah, were very deep. So, but yeah, um, but I, I don't I don't really know that much about like Buddha and stuff. Um, but like, I wouldn't say that like 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 I think if you're saying that like because you have access to all this knowledge and stuff and like it kind of like goes in your brain and then you go into this cave and like you just sit and think and whatever and the stuff like within your brain kind of like you know just starts starts doing stuff and it becomes this like thing where like you start seeing you know you become like whoa like you, you become woke right you start, like, <laughs> um, and like stuff right um but i would say like it, it doesn't really apply to to muhammad right because he had like pretty much like no knowledge like he was he, he was he, like in terms of knowledge ways he was pretty poor in knowledge like he didn't really know much he was just a shepherd he was just a simple you know guy um he was of course a very very nice his character was amazing obviously uh but in terms of knowledge, he wasn't like one like the top like scholars, like top noble people. He pretty much like knew nothing. He didn't even know how to read or write, right? Just mm, ob mm. Like, fundamental. Um, but he he got this revelation and he started like spitting facts, right? So I see. Uh, yeah, yeah I, that, I would feel like that that kind of doesn't really like fit with with, with the thing um of like I, I like the Buddha example basically. But um, I don't know if this is uh like accurate. I, I, I remember hearing this somewhere. I don't know if it was his first revelation or if it was one of his revelations, though. But he got it, like, literally 
uh like in his like room or whatever like he like or, like in, in his house like he mm. literally just got a revelation like I, like and revelations would come to him like without any notice like they would just come to him and the and the first time he had one was like really traumatic because it's like wait what what the hell just happened to you mm. right like he started mm. reciting stuff this angel spoke to him like what like what like this that's crazy right so um he was kind of freaking out he was like you know i don't i don't know what the hell's going on his wife had to like you know comfort him and his wife was there to, like, like you know to help him and stuff um and that's why he had a really really strong attachment to his first wife because she helped him through all that mm -hmm. anyways long story short um I, I would say that like it's not like you you go into like a, a cave and like just all of a sudden like you just like you know become woke because you just stay in the cave like all your life or whatever right like be like a monk or something i would say like yes there is some substance in that where it's like you do because you have like the way i believe it i believe it's like you have you know like your body you have your heart or whatever and you also have like your soul like you're like your mm -hmm. spiritual like mm -hmm. sense right this body like isn't actually like like yours it's just like sort of like like a rental from god that like he's put your soul into and like this is your gun like working it um that's why like in islam we also like don't believe you should get like tattoos and like you know like all these sorts of things because it's not your your body in the beginning anyways long story short um so, I, no, I get it um, i get it yeah yeah so so anyways um in terms of like meditating and like being in a cave and stuff i feel like obviously like that you do connect to like god that way like because you you do like even like when you're praying for instance right you're like you're not like talking to anyone you're just like in like your own sort of like bubble mm -hmm. um and and what you're doing is that you are having a conversation with god essentially but i would say that like the um like a messenger of god is different from like a normal person so i i, I can still like you know have like a connection to god i can still like feel god like when i read the quran for instance i feel like something inside of me like i feel like i don't know like i feel like whenever okay whenever like i recite the quran somehow i don't know like what it is i always feel like look this like shiver up my spine like i don't know what it is okay i don't know what it is it comes sometimes it doesn't really come sometimes it just comes i'm like whoa where did it come from yeah um, i see but but like in, in that sort of a sense right if i it, it sort of similar to like you know just like being on your own like isolating yourself and stuff like just getting that but i would say that just because like you have all this knowledge, you isolate yourself and whatever, doesn't mean you're bound to like get enlightened. Definitely, right? no, definitely. I would, yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. There, are, there are definitely yeah. like different components to it, of course. Um, yeah, of course. It's. I don't think anyone that just. I mean, if that's the case, then all prisoners would be enlightened. Like. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, so I would say that like. Um, and and, and when, you, when you're talking about like how we have like a god inside of us. I feel like that that ties in parallel with like the, the my belief of like having like a soul because you have like your in Arabic you call it your nafs which is basically your ego um, and you also have like your soul which is like you know the your your soul which is I think similar to how you describe like like a, the God inside of you but I still believe that like that God like that's up there and your soul is is connected so like there's some I guess there's like some similarities where where it's like the God isn't like actually inside of you. But it's like you still have a connection to that god it's still like, it's still external of you um instead of it like being you know it, you are god pretty much or like you have the god part of you um but yeah so i would say that uh where was I even going so with? Like, i was like, gonna say yeah. with that with that you said there right so how the, the body is a rental and basically we have a soul yeah. and for example you give you the example of not putting any tattoos and other stuff or piercings on mm -hmm. your skin so what do you say about um bionic arms and prosthetic legs and to the point where as a civilization we're gonna get to the point where people would genuinely like change, swap out their eyes for more mechanic ones or swap out their arms for you know prosthetic or bionic arms so how does that how does that tie to it is it does that confirm it or does that go against that honestly to be honest that's a really good question because i i haven't really thought about like like so are you saying like so prosthetics are fine like if you if you've lost your arm like in an injury or something right like you need a prosthetics to survive but to, to say that's fine it's just you know again that is that is not so so for example prosthetics and a bionic arm would be exactly the same thing right so it doesn't matter what the context of it is the, no, if, no, no. I, if, I would say like if yeah, yeah if, if, if you're like let's say like cutting my arm off right mm -hmm. for like to put like a bionic arm in um I have so again. I haven't thought about this, and I would have to like mm. uh, again. Like I have to think about it. We'll have to have, we'll have, to have another speak. conversation. Definitely, this yeah, is not the exactly. last of it, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. But um, it, it but I, I do see uh, and, and it, in my opinion, it is fine. Like I, I believe, like in Islam, it is fine if you like you know have like like your arm cut off 
by accident, like you were in a war or something, mm -hmm. and now you need it, having a prosthetic would help you like in life and function and stuff. Obviously, but a tattoo, for instance, right? That's that's voluntary. That's like something you're doing to like just do to your own body. For even yeah. like the bionic arm, I would probably probably think that it would be like it would be a, a you know conferring or not not conferring, but like the, the opposite of the bad bad thing. Um, like let's say like you cut off your arm because you didn't like your arm and you want the bionic arm because it's super strong or whatever, right? I would say that that is probably on the side of like the same like tattoo thing where it's like Interesting. You're, you're, you're modifying your body. Um, that, that's what I would think. I haven't, you know, I yeah. haven't talked to like, yeah, yeah. I so, think, like, I think, no, that yeah. I, I see what you mean there. Um, yeah. I just, I just want to just get your perspective on it because I mean, mm -hmm. if we're moving towards a direction right now where we're just yeah. as a civilization where we've got the bit of comfort, like we don't have to worry about what we're eating the next day. Obviously, not, obviously there are many people that do, but in terms of, we don't have to go farm for our food, right? Uh, we don't have to worry about like, you know, a dinosaur or saber tooth tiger coming to take our kids or some shit. Like, so yep. that, 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 that's not the case. So with more comfort comes a lot more um, ability for us to like, you know, feed the self in the most healthy or unhealthiest ways. You know, have people basically overeating, which is, which in a sense can be seen as a sin in many in many religions, right? And even yeah, even even in reality, it's like, mate, you're you're genuinely harming yourself, right? Like you just you just eating mm -hmm. loads. Uh, but then again, you have a a case where uh, as we evolve, we're like, all right, now we can we we have a phone, right? We're basically cyborgs because we can't do without our phone. Like it's not attached to us physically, right? But <laughs> it's mentally attached to us. Like we're basically cyborgs because we carry around the phone. We, we can't do without it. So, um, so it, and that's just the beginning, right? So you have a case where, let's give the NASA example. So let's say it gets to the point where humans are gonna start like exploring asteroids. And for that specific subgroup of, of humans who are going to be um, exploring the asteroid, they require a tool for drilling because the, the humans there just drill better, right? Let's just give a hypothetical example. So what happens is that they then created, um, for, every, for every person going on that mission, they've cut up their, their right hand, right? Right there in the, in, the, in, the, in the elbow. They've put a bionic arm which they can interchange. They can interchange it with a normal hand for grabbing stuff. They can interchange it with a drill bit for drilling. They can interchange it for a scanner, for scanning the environment, wherever it is. So now, that set of human beings, so they're using that for a purpose because that is what they're working with, right? But again, it's a forced engineering because it's like, well, there is no need for you to cut off your hand. But now, because we're all in space and we're having to do this, we're going to do this this way. Uh, and I'll even take it a step further. Say, um, every human... Maybe there's stuff like um, uh, there's there's stuff like global warming, for example, that like rises the sea levels. So now every human has to be able, to, like the, the houses we live on now, are like you know we have these tall, long stems, and like the houses like float on top of water. And maybe we have to basically get down to the sea, get some stuff from the sea, and then mm -hmm. fly back up. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just giving this hypothetical situation, and then yeah, every yeah, yeah. and every human being then has to then change their nose because they need to be able to breathe on the water. So Everyone's nose gets cut off and then it replaced with this device that allows us to swim in the water. And then our legs all have like fission powered um, rockets that allow us to boost ourselves out of the water back to the land, right? For example, mm -hmm. so I'm just giving an example in this case where yeah, yeah, we're yeah, genuinely okay. modifying ourselves. So yeah. <laughs> how does the ethics of that now balance? Yeah. With, I, know. I know, of course, you see, and I think on a philosophical level, you can, you can go quite deep with it. And that's why I do want to understand uh, of course, I know you say you're not a scholar, you're not a, 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 an Islamic scholar, but definitely, I, I like to understand more in terms of like how how you see it playing out, and like, all right, how ex how does this align with the ethics of the message from the from the religious text? You know what I mean? Or yeah, religious beliefs? Like that, that, that is something that, like, that, again, like. Um I, I, that is something like I haven't thought about like at all, right? Of so, course, don't worry, man. I, I, it's, a really, it's a really interesting <laughs> scenario because, um, like, I was even thinking about like, for instance, like, like another sort of like gray area. I think I, I think it is a gray area, right? Mm, and, mm. Like this scenario. And then another gray I, I, I had is I was actually, um, you know, like interviewing for this company uh, that basically they they you, you know about cellular agriculture, right? It's like lab grown meats and stuff. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so they were they were a company like doing cell agriculture. I love cell ag; it's amazing. Mm. Um, but what they were doing is that they were uh, like cultivating pork in the lab, right? And pork is, of course, like yes. like you know, like, can't eat it in Islam. Yes. So I was like, you know, can I 
be working for a company that, <laughs> that's, that, that creating that sells, that's creating it that's creating support but in the lab it's not, it's not a pig it's like it, it's a lab so i was like it's, it's a great yeah area. that is very great it's, it's not it's not a pig but it does come from a pig eventually like in the beginning right mm. so gray areas like these it's best to just like stay out of it obviously it's best to stay out. of course if i but how long can you stay away from it? Like, <laughs> it's the thing. It's the thing. If if it was like a life and not in life and this, but if it was like I had like no other way to make money, like I had, I need to make money like right now. Otherwise, like tomorrow I'm like gonna die. It's if it's a very very like crucial scenario, and that's how I need to make money. Then like yeah, obviously like that's the only thing I can do, right? I'm not gonna like kill myself over something that's mm, that's like this. That's mm. obviously the worst scenario. But um, I think it's even it's even a thing where it's like I can't. Okay, so I, don't quote me on this, but I think this is this is true. Where it's like if you literally have nothing to drink, you have like n no other choice right now. Like, and you, the one thing that will like save you is like drinking like some alcohol that will like that's like the only thing around you, right? I believe it is okay in that scenario to drink it. I'm not. Don't call me on that. But no, I, no, it's fine. I, like I yeah, said, yeah, yeah. I know you're not a, a, a Islamic yeah, yeah. philosopher, <laughs> but I, again, I haven't finished reading the Quran as well, so I, it's not like I can even like confirm that because yeah, yeah. it's like because for me, from from my knowledge, it's like well, who who do you think you are? Like, why, why should you be alive? You know, if, if, if you're in that scenario right there, why sin to stay alive? Like, what if yeah. that is the scenario in which God has put you that actually that is it? it, it that's it the end. It wouldn't even be, it wouldn't even be a, a sin in the, like, like, like if it is, if, the, if what I said is true, then that you drinking the alcohol wouldn't even be. Interesting. Sin. Inter ah, yeah. I see. I see. I see. Yeah. It's a paradox in a sense. Yeah. Kind of. It's just, it's just like, like, even like, think about like fasting, right? So, um, like it's, it's a, it's a, it's a sin. Like if you know about fasting and stuff, like not to fast within Ramadan. Right. Mm -hmm. But let's say you are like, you know, really, really sick or something, or you are, you, you are like traveling or something. Right. Or like, you can't just like fast cause you were traveling in an airplane and whatever. Right. Um, in that, in that, in that scenario, it's okay. Like you, you don't, you don't need to fast in that scenario. It's okay. Like you're fine. Right. So it's, it's like, um, if it's hard for you, like basically like God wants to make things easy for you, right? So <laughs> in that case, it's not gonna be like, oh, like you are traveling, I made you travel because like, you know, I want you to like sin and like not do this. No, it's like, you know, he, he made it like not a sin for you. I so see. things like that are, are, are things in Islam. Um yeah, so like like even the alcohol thing, like if if I would have said this true, then um No, it's fine. Right. I'm not I'm not yeah. quoting you on it. It's yeah, 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 it's, yeah, it's yeah. interesting you're anyways. Not, yeah. You're not you're not out there to get me. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Oh it's yeah, oh, it's yeah. fine. It's been really, really, really nice talking to you. I was gonna ask you if you had any actually you can just send it to me, like any resources for your work and stuff that you're doing. And um yeah. Awesome. Well, yeah, thanks you so much for having me, inviting me on. Awesome, like, man. It's been it's really, really fun talking, it's man. It's been a really interesting conversation. <laughs> it has been. All it, over the place. it has been, yeah. man. It has been. Thank you as well yeah. for just opening up as well and sharing, man. I think it's been yeah, blessed. Man. Thank yeah, you man. so much. Thanks, thanks for reaching out. Like, what, what a crazy thing, eh? Like, from a LinkedIn comment to like a three hour, <laughs> <laughs> two hour conversation. Yeah, yeah. Crazy. No worries, man. Man, until next yeah. time, man. Stay blessed, yeah, man. Have totally a lovely cool. day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, man. Take care. Have a lovely day, too.